من کارهای بدی کردم اون چیزایی که پدر تو دوست داری بود جشنند پسر خوبی دروغ نبا تا پسر خوب هستی چرا خوش کن نشبه شبیه با جودی ای دختر در تاریکی کنده قد منو نمیدونی چرا دنبال منی؟ چیزی که میبینی دوستی؟ نه بس چی هستی؟ من بدم خواستم برخشی اگه الان یه دونه طوفان می آمد یه دونه طوفان خیلی شدید از پشت اون کوه ها چیزی عوض می شود Hello, <laughs> we are here, we are back. I have a little squeaky voice today, so <laughs> do, you can, I apologize in advance. Um, so today we are talking about um, a film by Anna Lily, and I, can, I want to make sure I say this right, and Rimpour, I don't know, apologies if I'm really bad at pronouncing <laughs> So I'm just going to say, I'm so bad at And this was um, this is her film, which was her feature debut, which was in 2014, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. Um, and this film, I think, I don't know, a lot of people that, um, you know, that are in my friendship group and that I sort of knew when this film came out, we're all really eagerly anticipating it. We didn't know what it was about and there was kind of a lot of vibe going on. Um, so I kind of was really excited to see it when it came out and had no real expectations. I just knew that it was sort of vampire-y. It was black and white. Um, it had kind of like a mod vibe. And there was a skateboard, which all things I like. So um, that sort of, you know, it was my draw to it. But um, I think this film for me is very much, um, it's a film that's not, it's really not like any other film. Um, and it's, you know, and I guess, of course, it has this unique experience when we're looking at American Iranians as well, which is something that, you know, we can't, I can't specifically relate to, but I can certainly relate to the circumstances that Anna is drawing from um, in the different sort of story arcs and relationships within the characters in the film. Um, and yeah, I really wanted to do this one because I haven't seen a lot on it and I know a lot of people Um, really like this film and have like lots of different views about what they got from it and what they think it's about and you know the the key goal of the film and I think um, you know one of the biggest things which I thought it was so you know I'm sure many other people did is that it was a very much a feminist film which Anna Lily says it is not and it was not intention to her intention to do so and you know so that that really like blew me because it's such a film that has so much amazing like dialogue and just discourse around issues that are really strong, um, I think, when um, when looking at, at films which, you know, have this very um, strong feminist kind of angle. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I really, like, felt this film and really loved it. But, yeah, that was something that I didn't realise at the time. But, yeah, anyway, um, I guess to the girls because you both <laughs> decided to do this film as well. Yeah, I, I this is one of my favourite uh, films in the vampire genre i would say probably my favorite of all time is always going to be the hunger just because it's so cinematic and it has david bowie and Catherine Deneuve and susan sarandon and soundtrack with bauhaus and this uh well, amongst others of course and this is this reminds me of that uh the cinematography is just as important or is just as much a character in a way as the film as the other characters in this film it's shot in black and white um uh sheila vand vand who plays the lead plays the girl 
I can't imagine her in any other, I can't imagine another person playing that character. Like she is so, uh, the girl. And it, it, even when I see her in other things, I'm like, but, but you're a vampire. Like I just, I can't <laughs> take her out of this movie and put her in other things. And she's a very talented actress who's in many things. Um, but it's, it's that it's Colin from Brian Jonetown's Massacre's music behind it, which is that spaghetti Western. And if you're familiar mm. with Brian Jonetown Massacre, they're a great indie band that would break up on stage at every performance. Yeah, they would, they would just hear, and it was a disaster. As I, lived in, I, the universe, lived, but anyway. I lived, I lived in San Francisco when they lived with some of my friends. So that was not an act. Like they just. No, it's not. No, my friend just worked on their tour and they were punching each other. It was really. Oh, hard. yeah. Like there's a great documentary about them you should all watch that's about that. But call it like the guy that did the music, the background for music is very spaghetti western which is what they want in this film you know a lot of times this film is described as uh you know an artsy or atmospheric uh iranian vampire western right sometimes it's not even called a horror film it's just called a western and you get that because the town is a ghost town the music it's shot in black and white but it's a kind of black and white that's very stark uh kind of like rumble fish coppola's rumble rumble fish which is a black and white but it's not like gimmicky you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't feel like a gimmicky choice to do black and white. Um, all the characters in this movie are very memorable and distinct, right down from the love interest to the drug dealer to the little boy that she stops in the street and asks, are you a good boy or a bad boy? I, it, It's just such a beautifully shot film. And also, um, I don't see a lot of films in Farsi. Like, I'm not familiar with Iranian cinema. So Farsi to me is a beautiful language. So I, I like it just for that. And I guess that's just, that is such a white girl thing to say, but I do love the language and I love, I love everything about this movie. Like there's just so many scenes in this movie. Like when she just has her stripey shirt on and you know, it's, she's inside hanging out with the boy playing records. That's my favorite. Yeah. It's so romantic. Like it's such a romantic film too. So and the characters are so distinct. So I I love this film. I love the filmmaker who made it. Anna's amazing. And I highly recommend all of you watching this. As soon as you're done watching this, go and search on YouTube for uh, Vice Movies. Vice did an interview with her and Sheila that's very good. That talks about the inspiration and how this movie came to be. And how hard was it to write a script in both Farsi and English. And every time there was a change, that's double the work, right? And yeah. Uh, and also it's, there's things lost in translation too. So I, I just love this movie. It's one of the, it, I feel like it's a classic. I feel like it's a movie that's underrated. If you love, uh, you know, atmospheric, beautiful horror films that are more about the love of the characters and the panic and anger and, and the loneliness of being a vampire of a certain age, cause she's over a hundred. I think this movie is for you. The soundtrack's great. And there's moments where it feels like art. Like if you just did a screen grab, you could print it out and frame it. And that's yeah, it's, it's, it's just beautiful art. aesthetics. To me, that's what I love the most about this film. It's the aesthetics. Yeah. Like I can watch what? it forever. Like there's there's like um, Patti Smith vibes going on. There's a lot of like, you know, French cinema, neo noir. Like there's very mod, like, and there's even like expressionist stuff in there. Like it's just all like beautiful. I mean, art. even just the skateboard scene, her on a skateboard. Oh. Love, I mean, like, <laughs> right. I mean, that is, and so I'll, I'll let you uh, also talk uh, about what you like, Jenna, too, because there's just so much. So I feel like we could fill this whole hour just talking about how much we love different parts of this movie and how beautifully shot it was. But go ahead, Jenna. <laughs> go ahead. I mean, I don't know what to say that you ladies haven't already said. I mean, I just finished watching it again, actually, like 15 minutes before we got on here. Um, and I hadn't watched it since it first came out. Um, so I actually went in like kind of blind because I couldn't remember exactly all the details or anything like that. I knew the general like idea of it, but I was just stunned again at just the art of it, like how beautifully crafted the look is that she went for. Um, and I think it's just so iconic. Like I think that there's, I haven't ever seen anything that's like this. You know, the music, I, I didn't even write that many notes because I just kept being like, I love this music. I think the music was so like, it was, I don't know, it was so dramatic at times and then just so like 
the kind of music I would like listen to right now, like on a record. I was going to say the scene, the scene, I just, I don't know why, but I imagined Jenna when I heard it anyway. <laughs> in the scene, that, like the, you know, the romantic scene when kind of, you know, I mean, not deliberately, but it is that scene when um, Arash goes back to the room and, you know, they, she puts the music on and it's um, White Lies and Death and, oh, my God, and that song just comes up and he stands up and then they just do that slow motion look at each other. That is one of the best uses of a song. I was just like, <laughs> wow, this is such – because I, I know the song and it's a banger, but it was just the way that they so – like it was worked in was so good. It's so good. And I think that I, I agree with you. Like there's so many different – like layers to this um there's you know there's the arc of like you know the lady of the night and you know then it, there's the like dad is it the dad or the uncle like what dad he's the dad right and he's got like a drug problem and the like wife is like dead right mm -hmm. like and like so he falls into like this drug like arc the story arc and everything mm -hmm. like that and then like and then their lives just kind of get all entwined and everything like that and mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know the way that it ends and everything like that is I you know I think this movie is so much like it is a vampire film it is like an art film it does absolutely have that whole like French like film vibe which is why I really like it a lot as mm. well um I agree that like you can put like you can print out a shot of anything and it's like an art like it's like a picture you'd want to frame and like in your house or something. Yeah, yeah. You know? But then there's like, you know, there's also, it's kind of like a rom-com. It's kind of like a dark, it has like a dark story part, you know, storyline too. And like uh, elements to it as well. But like, it's also a romance. <laughs> it's yeah. like a dark romance. And I think of course, that's why I like it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, of course. That's what, of course it is. Like, hello, look who, who we're talking to here. <laughs> yeah. But like, no, that is, it's like the, there's that dark romance of it that I really like because I mean, the film from the outset, like it's very, like everything, you know, from the way it's shot, from the movements to the atmosphere, you know, um, throughout when it sort of, especially when it starts off, you know, there's this real feeling of, you know, of isolation and and oppression and loneliness and, you know, this it, it, there is a real kind of heavy feeling about the environment these characters are living within. Um, and I, you know, and it's very much, you know, something where you know originally you sort of see it and it's I guess it's 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 a story I guess about you know women reclaiming their power and you know I guess an analysis of kind of you know the imbalance imbalances between men and women and 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 then of course there's very clearly an arc you know that's talking about gendered violence that that women face you know um and looking at that kind of and then that's I guess like subset of arc which is looking at addiction and and where that kind of stems from, where it takes you and and what are those circumstances around that that then, you know, peter out into everyone else's lives. Um, and then you have what I liked about it was the way I think that Anna uses the kind of the girl, you know, rather than giving her a name or, or you know, kind of making her, um, I don't know, like kind of like giving this kind of clear story to her, keeping her ambiguous and just kind of, you know, giving, using that trope, you know, that kind of is like monster woman and like kind of like subverting that stereotype essentially because you don't feel like she's a monster, but she don't feel like she's an angel either. But the, the way she keeps the girl in that kind of weird limbo of ambiguity, you kind of can't put her in the box of being one or the other. Like I often forget that this film, she's a vampire um, because it isn't very overt. It's more of a, you know, this kind of lingering feeling rather than it's only when she attacks that you remember oh yeah like you know I, I think when the film came out I thought it was actually just a woman who like attacked <laughs> I didn't even realize it was a vampire. and I was like you know and that, I was like oh and she's a vampire that's even better love it but um I think you know that that sort of thing I think is is really good because I mean you're looking and then it's looking at this kind of I guess it's like a you know the anti-hero like vigilante in a way that's looking out you know looking out for the women you yeah. know, in, in Bad City. Um, you know, she's looking out for the women and, you know, going up against men who are using, you know, their power, their control, their, you know, their violence. Yeah, thank and gosh she killed that first guy. He was really scuzzy. Oh, yeah. Gross. Was I mean, that's, that's something I think about <clears throat> quite a bit when I watch movies like this because, of course, it, you can't help but put yourself in that scenario or in that character and... 
first of all, <clears throat> when you're over a hundred and you're a woman, I would think your level of I am completely over it is probably hits tilt real quick because it's like seeing history repeat itself repeatedly. You were there for probably some of the worst times in human human history. You've lived for a very long time, but you're just, I mean, it would be like being an adult around preschoolers the rest of your life, because there's never going to be anyone that's going to meet your standard of like knowledge and experience and maturity because you're over a hundred and what was 180, 150. I can't remember what her age is in this, but it's quite old though. Young and vampire years, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, it's interesting also because she's not quite a vigilante. I mean, she's not like a superhero going out and just, you know, ridding the earth of horrible men. Cause that would, take a long time and that would get rid of half the population. So that's not a good, I, it's not all, I should say half, but you know, a lot, it would be a lot. And for her, I feel like she chooses. 25, 30, 35%. I mean, you would have your work cut out, but I, I mean, there's, and there's horrible women too. Um, and there's yeah. people that are horrible non-binary as well. I'm not going to okay. make gender thing here, but honestly, you know, I keep thinking, um, you know, she, she's got to feel so lonely. And sometimes and when you think of vampire films, you know, a lot of us think of pop culture ones or ones where it's a love story where it's a, a vampire that hooks up with a human and makes the human a vampire and then that's their ha happily ever after or not. Or it's other vampires hanging out with other vampires or it's another vampire hanging out with another non-human, whether it's a werewolf or whatever. And this is very interesting because it's very solitary. She does seem lonely, but she also, I think, chooses wisely who she hangs out with and who she wants to spend her time with. But also she chooses who she's going to torment very interestingly. Cause yeah, she killed that one guy, but then stopping the little boy in the street and literally scaring the bejesus out of him, asking him, are you good or, 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 you know, basically he's running away from her and he thinks he's away from her and he, then he runs into her. Cause of course vampires are very fast. They can move wherever they want. And just him going, yeah, I'm a good little boy. Like just, and she's like, I will, be with you. Like I will be watching you your whole entire life. And then reminding him that she could take out his brain through his eyeballs or whatever. It was just like, and it's a little boy. And I kept thinking, well, that's one kid that hopefully won't turn into a serial killer and hopefully will behave himself because she's going to be the most horrific version of Santa ever. Cause she's going to be watching you the whole time. Oh, oh, no, I have a little tidbit on that as well. Okay. You, know how, you know how we love our little tidbits is like oh, yeah. whether, we, whether we saw it or not. So yeah. when I, re I, I like it, I've, I remembered it and then I wasn't sure. And then I, when I was rewatching it, cause I rewatched it again, obviously um, before this and I was like, Oh yeah. So when she does tell the little boy, mm -hmm. do you realize he's got a candy and he's slowly unwrapping it to have it. And, oh. at the same, and, and at the same time, he's also watching, you know, all these kind of drug people around him. I'm yeah. like, I think it's a subtle, like, you know, it's also a subtle nod to like the different levels of addiction and how, mm. you know, it's that, you, you know what I mean? Like, cause yeah, I, I was like, and then I, when I was rewatching, I was like, that's right. Yeah, he is. And he's like, yeah, he's unwrapping it. I there. thought he stole it. I thought he no. stole the candy and that's why she was, but you don't get a lot. That's why this movie's so great. The backstory. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, you could get so many little things off of you. You can just like art. You can interpret it in a different way than other people watching, and everyone's going to get something different out of it and have a different experience. And everyone's going to have different yeah. references because maybe they don't watch a lot of horror film, or maybe they come from an Iranian background, or maybe they come from a background where they grew up in a town like this, which it is a ghost town. There's people in it, but it is all caps rural and all caps desolate. And yeah. uh, there's a sense of dread all throughout, even if she wasn't in the film and it was just about these people. I yeah, think it's it still, still a really horrible. sad feeling going on. It's so there's so much dread. There's so much like uh, ennui mixed with dread. It's just not a great mix of, to be growing up in that area. And but at the same time, she finds her fun. She finds her people, I guess, in a way, and her entertainment. And just the skateboarding scene alone. I'm sorry, but I'm still always going to be thinking about that. No, that is not Sheila on the skateboard. That is the director. No, it's Anna. I was yeah. about to say, obviously, because I am a big skateboard head. Um, Me too. <laughs> I, and, and Anna is a lifelong skateboarder. So, mm -hmm. yes, that was a part of the reason why it was all built into this film. But um, and one, of, one of the things I also wanted to mention on this is that this film goes alongside a comic book that, that Anna created that was in line with this film. 
which I don't know if you can still buy it now, but apparently it's beautiful and I have seen some copies of it. Is it, called, is um, it the same title of the film? Or exactly is it called the same film? title. It's red, okay. red, red, white, um, red, white and black. Um, okay. But yeah, one of the really amazing things about this film, and I think sort of John kind of touched on it um, in our comments about how, you know, there is that commentary around, you know, how Iranian women feel as well as, um, you know, in that environment and also, you know, American Iranian women who are no longer in that environment and their feeling towards that, you know, that feeling of isolation and, and you know, feeling oppression um, as well. And one of the most amazing things I think about this film is that this film was started by an Indiegogo campaign. Mm. And yeah. um, the main reason, obviously, was, you know, I didn't know that. But aside from that, um, this was the only way that Anna could make the film um, mm -hmm. because, you know, um, in able, you know, she wasn't able to film um, in Iran, um, but also, you know, it's actually you had to get specific film permits um, to be able to film in Iran. And of that, you're also there's really strong laws prohibiting um, any kind of filming of anything that is um, romantic love, all depictions of romantic love. Oh, so, interesting. so, um, yeah, it, it, so a lot of it was filmed in, you know, it was filmed in America and parts also. It was tap, tapped California. I just wanted to mm, say. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, without that, you know, it was very hard for her to make this, this um, project. And I think oh, yeah. in itself that is amazing because that also highlights exactly what this film's kind of makes yeah. is making people discuss. And that is this, the idea of things and that women face and the kind of scenarios which we find ourselves in and how that balance of power and balance of importance is so crucial in different you know, in different gender, you know, lives and different people's backgrounds and all of those things. Like we, we take a lot of things for granted. And I think, you know, this is a situation where we not only get to see an amazing piece of art, but we understand someone else's perspective that we personally have not, um, you know, come into contact with or, you know, weren't aware. And I think it just kind of blew my mind when, when I, um, you know, was like looking more into it because I knew about the Indiegogo, but not the the kind of reasoning in terms of laws mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So that was really interesting to me that to be making a film that sort of has this whole discourse around power and control, and and then the you know kind of our irony of having to do it this way because it's still that way and nothing is. Well, changed. also, I mean, on the flip side, could you imagine her pitching this in Hollywood? No. Nope. <laughs> well, I mean, no, definitely all, not. no, no. I mean, this is, thing, I love, this is why, and we've talked about this many times, especially when we interview independent filmmakers who are women, who identify as women. The horror genre on its on its own is a lot more welcoming to new ideas, new things, new like, than regular cinema, than drama, than thriller, than comedy, than you know mainstream cinema, and even indie that's not horror. Um, or the green screen, green screen movies, right? Like it's, there's just not, this would not, it wouldn't fit in that realm anyway. I would have never wanted to, to be a big production because I feel like it would lose its charm. It would lose its, you know, really amazing uh, feeling. And also she would probably lose control of the film. Like I'm sure somebody would be yeah. like, Hey, little lady, we'll just take this off your hands and make it hey, into little the lady. <laughs> yeah, we'll just, we'll just turn it into Iranian twilight. And it's like, no, no, no. And so I'm really glad. I mean, Twilight. I mean, I'm really glad that. Well, and also they wouldn't have done Iranian. They probably would have just been like, let's just put it here. Let's not mess with I Iran because the problem is, is that you know when you go to mainstream cinema, there's too many, there's too many gatekeepers, there's too many people in charge of the money that say no to things that you probably should say yes to if you want to make independent cinema look good and also be different and also not just be a carbon copy of everything else that's on the screen right now. And Indiegogo, I know particularly, is for a lot of filmmakers go there to raise money. They don't go to Kickstarter. They go to Indiegogo because Indiegogo, I think, has different rules about Kickstarter. I think you have to raise the amount you say you're going to raise or you don't get anything. Whereas Indiegogo, oh. I think you can get whatever you get. You can have a goal, but it doesn't have to be a, a threshold goal, I think. And also, I think there's they take less out. I'm not 100% sure. Like, there's plenty of crowdfunding sites out there besides Indiegogo and Kickstarter to do films. But what I like is she did it that way. She filmed it in 24 days, which is crazy to me that the whole oh, yeah. her film. That's so awesome. I didn't know that. Very yeah, cool. it's less than a month, which I can't even. I'll fathom. always come with the facts. 
Yeah, I well, actually I mean, learned so much. I just come here with my like, oh, it's pretty. Oh, I like the music. No, no, I, mean, <laughs> I, just, I, well, yeah. you know I think we, I think it's not a secret, but all three of us definitely want to make a horror film and definitely want to do it together. Or uh, I don't know. I'm still, I'm. You're still on my cast. You're all going to be in it once I have it. <laughs> but because of that, I look at the movies that I really respect and I really love, and I want to see. Okay, how long did it take her to write this? How many issues came up? What? How did she get the cast? So she's friends with these people that are in the cast. These are people she wanted to cast. She already had an idea of what she wanted and how she wanted it to feel. She knew it was going to be in Farsi. It took 24 days to film. She, I think she yeah, said that she, she was writing it. And then she does this thing where she says she goes to Las Vegas when she gets to like page 60 or something, writing notes and writing stuff down. So she hold, she becomes a hermit in a hotel in Vegas or something and finishes the script. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Cause also I'm very ADHD. So I'm easily distracted. Vegas would not be my first choice of a place to go to get something done. <laughs> Cause I would just be like, Oh, what's that noise? Oh, what's that pretty light? Oh, what's that? Like, I would never, you, I would have to go where I was a few weeks ago, which my friend uh, in LA, my, my beautiful hairstylist that makes my hair look great. She moved to Montana. So luckily she comes back once a month to do hair for everybody. But I pet sit for her for 10 days as a wedding present um, while she was off getting hitched in Hawaii. And it was in Helena, Montana. I've never been there. And it was pretty remote. I mean, it's a great little town. It's it's actually very queer friendly and very fun. And there's like lots of artisanal things and cool quirky things. But I was like, this is where I would go to finish something. It wouldn't be the sin. It wouldn't be Sin City. It would be remote city, not even city. It would be a place where there's maybe four Lyft drivers and a lot of snow. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave much. And I do wonder about that because, like, you, you know, Stephen King famously you know, wrote uh, The Shining, the book, The Shining, in uh, the Stanley Hotel. The Overlook Hotel is based on the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park. That is very remote. Estes is not huge. It is a mountain motel off in the outskirts of town. It's not like, you know what I mean? So for me, when I was looking at the little factoid trivia moments of this movie, I was like, how the hell did she do this? Because it's such a, a great film, but she did it in such little time, but she knew who yeah, she no. wanted in the lead. You know, she got Sheila Van. Sheila's amazing. I can't picture any other actors playing this part. She knew she bumped into Colin at a Brian Gentile massacre thing. And they were talking and he's like, Oh, what do you do? And she's like, Oh, I'm a filmmaker. And he's like, really? I just finished a bunch of music. I want to do this kind of sounds like a spaghetti Western. And she's like, really? I'll take it. Like, I mean, it was such a yeah. moment that I was just like, I think it was the universe saying we need this film to be done the way she wants to do it. So uh, to your point, I'm glad that Indiegogo and other ways to crowdfunding exists. So people and that- I've got to say too, it was only, um, the goal was 55K. Oh, see, and, how, how? Yeah, and, the, yeah, and the, the final she ended up with was just under 57K. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, and the whole, yeah, and the whole film, the whole film was filmed on digital with like anamorphic lenses. Yeah, no, it looks like it's filmed the old fashioned way. Like when I was in film school, which is one of the reasons I never got a film degree is it, your final project had to be a film and there was no digital yet. And uh, yeah. for those of you who don't know, it costs a lot of money to make a film, even just a student film. And uh, people have famously gone into a lot of debt, credit card debt and friendship debt and family debt just trying mm -hmm. to make their, 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 their college final film. Um, so I, you know, I kind of regret not doing that. I, I feel like there could have been ways I could have tried to put something together. But when I see people, you know, making digital now, I don't think they realize that when you make something on regular film, it's a whole other vibe, a other feel sensibility, but mm -hmm. there is a way to make it kind of look like that or make it look a certain way. That's not like everybody else. Well, like I didn't even pick, I didn't even pick up that this film was digital. And I didn't film. either. I thought it was regular uh, film. Yeah, so that's how much I know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that's the thing, you know, there is things. Yeah. I'm curious, Jenna, what did you think about the psychology of this movie, since that's your real house right now? What did you uh, What did you think of it with the, because oh, there's a lot. There's a lot to it. Mm. Well, I mean, I definitely thought that there was absolutely the feminist, you know, um, aspect of it. 
Um, I think that there was just, I think my heart was kind of broken though by like the story of the addict with, you know, with the, the lady of the night. Yeah. And like that, that scene where she's like dancing for him. I don't know. There's something like so like tragic, but like also beautiful about that scene. And I think that that was just a very impactful scene. I don't know about the psychology but, like behind this. I mean, I'm sure that there's more that I probably missed because I kind of watched it very rushed today. And I think I was over, I think I was focusing mostly today just kind of on the aesthetic of it all. Because yeah. I hadn't watched it since it came out, which was well, like, it's hard, to, it's hard oh. to not, not, you know what I mean? I was like, like the psychology stuff you found because, like, I don't know. I also just got out of final, so I feel a little brain dead. No, I don't want to. No, I felt like as soon as I that, I like to find the the different, like, you know, there was the obviously the different archetypes, you know, of women character, you know, within the film. So you had, you know, you've got the girl who, you know, has her own agency, her own power, and then you've got, you know, um the princess you know which is the girl who's very sheltered and lives in the big nice place and you know arash is working at the at the home and then you you know got lady of the night um then you also have like characters like rockabilly you know which is like all of these are probably characters that, which would be quite um which is I think controversial if this was he's very, the, he's very james dean what's well, colin oh, no, that's a rush that's a rush no, no that yeah. guy felt very james dean though oh, right? rockabilly. Yeah. Rockabilly, Rockabilly Colin, is though, yes. from uh, Brian Jonetown's Massacre. That actually yes. is Colin. Was that the <laughs> yeah. bad guy? Yeah. He was the awful guy? He, he played the character Rockabilly, so hmm. I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, also the one, the, the, <laughs> one, um, the character that was kind of dancing around, you couldn't tell. It kind of looked like maybe a drag queen, but not. Oh, right. okay. No, no. I, I liked that character. I, yeah, didn't, yeah. Like, I didn't like the bad guy who got killed. He was really No, good. Saeed is the drug dealer. He was like cool. the, based off of Ninja from Die Outward. So if you which is saw, very obvious. But, oh, uh, <laughs> when I first watched it, I'm like, is that Ninja? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and even the tattoos are quite similar and the hairstyle was quite similar. Yeah, um, his sex across his neck, and then it was yes. also written on a wall in the movie. At one point, there was a, another sex written on the wall, and I was like, "Hmm, I wonder if that's intentional." Say, I probably would have been, I guess, but well, I know yeah, that the tattoo, the tattoo on Seed Scalp, Seed Scalp reads uh, Jakesh, Jakesh, which is Farsi for pimp. It's Persian for pimp. Mm. Yeah, he's uh, awesome. so there's like fun little. I mean, I don't know if that's fun, but you know, there's like little like <laughs> nods to. There's little knocks at the end, also the Madonna poster. The Madonna yeah, poster! That's but that's not Madonna. That was, was it Margaret Atwood? Who is it? It's supposed to look like um, another, it's like a prominent feminist. I can't remember her name. That like uh, got, I, you're, I'm going to have to revoke my feminist card and take my name off of <laughs> hey, that. Like hey, I'm missing so many brain cells tonight because I literally just ended my quarter yesterday and I have like just been like, oh. No great. I, I, yeah. I barely can remember why I entered a room anymore um, to the point where I feel like I'm living the movie Memento where I have to put post notes on everything to remember, okay, what did I do? What, how do I, what's going on? Like, this is one thing I do wonder about vampires, right? Because when you're human, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just something I get to do. Uh, and it's also, maybe it's an ADHD thing, but as we get older, we forget stuff and we forget a lot. When you're a vampire, as you get older, Assume your brain doesn't deteriorate like a regular human's and you would maybe remember, but like, what if you were ADHD before you became a vampire? Are you ADHD <laughs> vampire or does it like fix stuff? I think like it you fix stuff. Could you imagine? Oh, no, no, no. You'd be like, you would be like feeding on someone and they'd be like, oh, that meal looks better. Yeah, you'd be distracted, <laughs> right? You think everyone hates you at all times. You are insecure. I mean, a vampire with imposter syndrome would be a great film, and maybe I will make that film. But I do wonder about that because I know in like different books, like Anne Rice's books, when a van when someone was sick, because this is why Lestat made his mom a vampire. He was dying of cancer, and so he thought I'll make her a vampire, and it and it heals everything, right? Like you can see that in film, you can see that in comics, books, games, whatever. When you're when you become an immortal vampire, yeah, the process is gruesome. And you have a 50 50 chance of dying. Yeah. But it's supposed to fix everything. But by fix everything, I assume that means disease and maybe some chemical imbalance. But if you're psychotic chemically, it's, like, <laughs> it's like Spike in Buffy. You just get more psychotic. 
Yeah, yeah. well, no, because he didn't start psychotic. If you remember, well, okay, the you know what I mean? You can just, but if you're already, I guess. Yeah, Spike started off as a bad poet, as a human, and then became yeah, a man. Right. And more and more badass as punk rock evolved. So I think he became, <laughs> Billy, you know, he became Billy Idol, the vampire. Yeah, he became Billy Idol meets uh, <laughs> uh, someone I'm very close to on Real World London. Anyway, I wonder, though, what the vampire stuff just y'all make some funny statements. Yeah, uh, that? is there anything? Um, yeah, so, why not? Wait, what just happened? We're just, I just name dropped an ex I shouldn't have. We're just gonna be able to get it. I'm like, <laughs> well, with vampire stuff, because I'm obsessed, with, I'm goth, we're all goth. This is a coven. Hey, I'm, I'm wearing pink, pink tonight, yo. I'm wearing I'm here's our Barbie, you're the Barbie witch, Barbie witch, right. Uh, with vampire lore, though, it's like, okay, uh, you're solitary, you're lonely. We get that. I mean, so many vampires have done that really well. Angel did that. Um, name a vampire who isn't lonely and you've got a psychotic, or you've got a vampire that, like, you know, chose well with friends and lovers. But this one was different because it just feels like she's lonely, but also there's cultural differences for sure. We're, I'm used to seeing European based vampire movies, not Middle Eastern based vampire movies, not vampire movies that are not, I don't want to say Catholic or Christian based, but you know, there's not in mainstream cinema, there's not a ton to choose from. So it's kind of like having a different cultural experience in mm. a movie like this mm. makes it even better and makes it more interesting, but also makes mm. me think of other things I've never thought about because I don't know a lot about Iranian culture and I don't know a lot about how women See. are treated. And also, it's very different to be a woman in Iran than a woman who comes from Iran that lives here, and also being born as an American in an Iranian family that's here. So there's like different facets to this, and I think it's interesting that our filmmaker does, you know, go into those things and does present those things. And I really liked it because it was a definitely um, a thing where I'm like, I want to learn more about this. And again, having the, you know basic white girl talk about it like this. I hope I'm not offending anyone watching, but to me, it made me think, oh yeah, you know what? There's so many other stories to be told and in this genre. And I'm glad this one was told and I'm glad I got to see it. And I'm glad I love it. And I'm glad so many other people got, So by the way, I will just do a quick little rant. I loved when Joe Bob Briggs on last drive-in interviewed her in season one, episode 14. Oh my goodness. But minutes, episode fourteen at three minutes and four. Minutes. But the problem is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a downer for a minute. I'm sorry, people, but unless you recorded it, it's gone because of streaming rights. Shutter, which is part of AMC Plus here in the United States, they don't get to hold on to films forever because of streaming licensing issues. So I was gonna go back today and watch the interview, and I couldn't because it's gone because AMC does not own it for this month. I guess Paramount Plus and Apple. TV on it, but they don't own Joe Bob Briggs' interview with her. So it's gone, gone. I don't even know where the interview is. And I was so angry because if you watch, if you have Shudder, if you watch The Last Drive-In, Joe Bob Briggs is a well-known personality in horror films, but he's a reviewer of films. He's He has a degree in films. He's a comedian, but he knows film history inside and out. And he respects independent filmmakers. And the interview was so good. And she was so like, you know, explaining that this process is a process, but everyone should do it. Like, it's not this elitist thing. And I think a lot of people, when they love film, they could think of Hollywood and they think of mainstream studio system. And that doesn't exist anymore. You don't need it to make a film like this. And I think she proved you can make a quality film, crowdfunding it, working with your friends, doing different things, telling a different story, shooting it, and something that's not a million dollars budget, mm -hmm. shooting it at a place where you can shoot things and not have to have a zillion permits. And also get a soundtrack with a dude you just met at a party. Like, that's amazing. I love everything about this background of the story because it's like, oh, my God, she she worked hard on it. But it's not like this thing that's unattainable. And that's why I love this movie, just because it's, yes, it's a piece of art and it's beautiful. And it's well casted, well filmed. Everything about it's great. but it's doable. It's not something that you had to get like Spielberg to sign off on or Disney to give you the money or Miramax or anything. Anyway, sorry. I didn't mean to be such a long TED talk. But yeah, that's um, <laughs> I'm like, Woo. I'll go like we flash. Anyway. Um <laughs> I have, you tell them my Adderall just kicked in. Anyway. Um, um, 
<laughs> I was going to say, sorry, but um, I was going to say, yeah, the one of the things that Anna did say was that, you know, she felt like if there was any political meaning against the film, she thought more so it wasn't really the, the Shador or, you know, the hijab, but it was more so, you know, that silent character of Rockabilly played by Reza who, you know, because it, you it's not okay to be gay in Iran. It is not okay to be gay in Iran. So for her, that was the, the thing that she felt was the most political thing about the film, which I also yeah. found interesting as well. Um, yeah, and also um, the violence. I mean, there's a scene where they throw the body in the pit with all the other bodies. That's a horrific scene. And it's not, it's also a ghost town, which means it's probably pretty lawless. So you're not going to have yeah. a Well, that's a kind of, it's not that, um, it does have that Sin City vibe of like, you know, everything being desolate, dead, empty, pit, you know, society's kind of let go and things are, are gone wild, you know. Yeah, and if you grew up How in a How many bad people has she killed? Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know. That's a good question. I wonder if she's killing off the town. Ah, ah. It could be because it's, it's so desolate, right? And you kind of, and at the, you know, this sort of seems like, you know, and, you know, her character is like just, like I said, just the only woman in this film. Does she really go from town see. to town just killing off them off? And then every town, and that's her whole story, like her whole background, is that she goes from town to town, and in each town she tries to find more good people, but she just finds the same shit same humans in every place. <laughs> and so she just it's moves deep. from town to town, inevitably disappointed because humankind just fucking sucks. Yeah, I think you got it. <laughs> you got the well, I, mean, I haven't read the. That's what the graphic novel. I don't novel know. Is. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Well, <laughs> that's what the graphic novel is about. Um, Jenna, the graphic novel is about like the backstory of of Gunnar. Ah, Gunnar. okay. So oh. maybe that goes into maybe that goes into. Well, I just a bit made more. it up. But you know, <laughs> you just made it. You could make some kind of. I think it's a pretty good guess, and if it's not the real backstory, <laughs> Jenna, if you don't make this film, I'm going to be mad at you. If you like came up with that great idea, and also, and also, we'll do an ADHD, an ADHD vampire. Um. Oh, just to answer some comments, uh, John about uh, the Joe Bob Briggs, uh, John in the comments, John Peters is saying, oh, there's a section of segments. They do have his rants. They don't have his interviews. So I wasn't able to find the interviews. And also there's like four different ways to subscribe to Shudder. And I do Shudder through AMC Plus, but you can also do it through Amazon Prime or get the Shudder app. Or I think internationally it's done different ways. So, and I don't yeah, work for we just, use the like Shutter. we just use the Shutter app, but you can get yeah, it through Amazon as well. The only I don't use the Shutter app is they don't have um, subtitles for English stuff because I put subtitles on everything. I use subtitles. Like I, I click on. I maybe that's just subtitles. Subtitles. maybe that's. I love <laughs> subtitles. I play every. I watch. That might be an American subtitles. thing. I literally. Uh, it's an app thing with Shutter. Most apps don't allow you to do that. BritBox and Acorn also don't let yeah, you do that. subtitles. Or if, or the subtitles are uh, not consistent, so sometimes it's like. No. It's well, like, they're fine. They're fine in Australia because I watch it all by a shutter. I watch. I just. I realize now that's again. I didn't. I don't want to turn this into an ADHD themed episode, but it's also that's an ADHD thing. Is that you need subtitles? You need extra. And also, I'm dyslexic, so. Um, so even though subtitles aren't going to help me with dyslexia, it helps me remember things or pay attention more. If I can see what's read out along with the voice, it's kind of like listening to an audio book. Yeah, you can keep track of characters too sometimes and their names. Yeah, and also um, sometimes there's lots of things lost in translation. Let's just say I know a lot of curse words in a lot of languages, and subtitles doesn't always get it correct, so that's fun. <laughs> and also you can learn real interesting trivia. So like if you watch Russian Doll, the TV series on Netflix, and you watch it with subtitles, um, you actually get things translated in, from Russian from like, I think the Pussy Riot song, some of the songs in there. And also there's just like little Easter eggs and things that are sci-fi related. So I, I always want, I always have subtitles on sometimes too. I can't understand accents or people will mumble or I just don't know what word they're saying. Cause maybe they, I'm hearing it a different way. So for me, it's just a way to like basically understand people in general. I wish I could push that button when I'm talking to people in person. Cause right? lots of I don't have a subtitle on you, please. Okay, I'm Australian. Australian. I just, yeah, I just, gonna get that. We're gonna there's no subtitle that. for me. Just watch. You know, we're gonna get that. When we end up with chips in our brains, we're gonna have that where we're just gonna look at people and while they're talking, we're just gonna see text. And I think didn't Google Glass do that? I feel like Google Glass, mm -hmm. the those funky glasses, those all the texts that, that we're wearing. Yeah. 
I think they did that uh, with Google Translate. I think it would translate in real time, but you had to read it, cool. it in your ear. Yeah, and also I think the TV series Echo, the Marvel um, uh, deaf superhero character, uh, uh, one of the characters who's like Kingpin basically couldn't be bothered to learn sign language, which is like, come on, dude, learn sign language. You've known this girl your whole life and like her whole life since she was a little kid and you didn't bother to learn sign language. So instead he got some Elon Musk like contacts put in that, I don't know, I'm using Elon as an example, but he got some <laughs> contacts put in that like show him what, like how to do things that she can understand. It was like a whole thing. I don't know why I started to say, see, this is why I could never be a vampire. I would probably confuse people with how many tangents I go into and how many distracting. You don't have time. You just try, you, you have to get blood and kill shit. You haven't got time to talk. <laughs> I have to, to like kill them slowly so I could have a conversation that's long enough to cover everything I need to cover. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. I was going to say something. Oh yeah. This wasn't it. The other thing that I thought, like, I think as well, this, the other thing in this film that I think like is really strong, obviously, and I think it gets like a, a little bit overlooked because we like, you know, everyone gets excited about the kind of, you know, the the more feminist leanings, but the, the stuff to do with addiction is really, mm -hmm. really, really strong. And I just like, and just even the little ways that it connects things like that, you know, using, using, you know, a vampire as kind of a, the kind of that character, this catalyst character, you know, a vampire is, you know, essentially an addict, in itself and I, I've read you know Anna saying exactly the same thing that that's a part of that kind of that relationship between the girl being a vampire is that same you know um instinctual feeling that same addiction to something that you need constantly and um I, I, I was looking at you know obviously the other parts you've got you know the father you've got the pimp even you know he's addicted to certain things and, and what he wants everyone in this in the film has some kind of weird relationship with something else or, you know, some well, and the kid thing. also tries ecstasy for the first time. Yeah. And we get like, we get my favorite line from the movie with that, with that scene. The, the line that says this pill is nothing without you. Yeah. Aww. I don't know why I love that line so much. This pill That's romantic. Is, I mean, it's, it's, no, it's romantic. It's, <laughs> again. it's interesting because it's true that like the drug is nothing without you. The drug is nothing until you actually take it. And, your body chemistry mixed with that drug makes it react into having this experience, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Without, yeah. You, so without you, the drug is an innate, like it doesn't do anything. Like you have to, you have to be added to the drug to have the, for the drug to, to have, have it, magic yeah. or for it to have its hold over you, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And like, and he's so, and I just, I love, I like the part where he does ecstasy. He's so cute, actually. I think he's kind of yeah. cute. He's all high, and he's like staring at the light. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a whole new because because a rash is like a really a rash is, is very and much like, like a. He's, he's like, like I, can't, I have to sit down now. Dude. I have to sit down now, and so he has to be put on the little. Well, side. I mean, I was trying to, <clears throat> I was trying to think of the first time I did X. I don't think it, I don't think it was like a safe place to do it. It was probably a rave. It was probably some place that was like with a bunch of people. Um, and also, this is the days before fentanyl, so it was like you could buy something off the street or buy something and know that you're not going to immediately die. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. Weird. There's no over. There's not. I don't want to say there's no way to overdose over it, but uh, when I took it and then I want to say 89, 90, probably 89, probably in high school, so maybe 88, 89. In the olden days, in the late 1900s, as we're supposed to refer to it now, because oh my god, um, I remember I took it and I, I immediately, you just basically feel like you're a living, living inside a rainbow, and that's not a, that's not a gay, I'm not, that's not a gay like uh, way of saying things. I'm trying to say it's not like you're suddenly gay. I was also just bisexual from the start, so it doesn't do anything to your sexuality. However. You become very amorous towards Body, you are on the level tonight, babe. <laughs> we used to say if you do X, you might end up humping a tree because you're just so horny and also <laughs> so open to any kind of sexual whatever. That X is kind of like a sexual, it's very good for chem sex because you basically are just like, yeah, okay. And it's it's not like a drug, it's not date rape drug. Like you know what's going on, you know what you're doing, but it's it's colors <laughs> more vibrant. <laughs> Sound more like you know, it's like all that, 
But like mushrooms are different because mushrooms. Welcome are to awesome. drug hour with Bonnie. <laughs> when Bonnie's gone, <laughs> I'm like, whoa. Here's the thing too. Bonnie is going to tell us all about all the drugs right now. And so I know. I feel like I'm, I'm, I am so glad I'm not a parent. And then now I am so glad I'm not a parent. I know. And I think I had this discussion with one of my nieces one Christmas. I just could see my brother. Or maybe it was my brother-in-law was just looking at me from across the living room telling me to stop talking. <laughs> Because they were, they were asking, but also we're in an era of fentanyl. So I'm like, don't take anything at all ever. Because I don't, everything on the street can have fentanyl in it. You got to be careful unless, now just carry a Narcon, Nar, Narcon pin with you like an EpiPen. Anyway, my point being, uh, I love that scene in the movie. But I don't think, I don't think if a vampire took X it, or Molly or anything, it would do anything. Because I think with vampire lore or vamp well, depends on what world building universe this is right like you can make your vampire do anything clearly because it didn't have a glitter twilight you know twilight made them glitter and they could be in sunlight that was a new thing but with uh vampires i don't think they can take drugs and have them do anything so i do wonder if you took the blood of a massive addict would you get some sort of contact high like if you were like Someone was like super duper on meth, and you drain them of their blood as a vampire. Would you get a little twitchy or not? I wonder. Probably, about that. I would think so. Right? Because it wouldn't yeah. nullify everything. Like it's kind of like if you. No, well, I would think so. I would think that that would be the only way that vampires could get like high or could get like intoxicated would be through like the tainted blood or the inebriated blood of their victims. Well, it's always like, I think the, what was it? Always the blood of virgins is supposed to taste really good or something. I don't know. I haven't tried it, but like, if you're a vampire. I don't know. Thank you, Bonnie. I'm so glad you haven't tried it. Youth and, yeah, youth virgins and stuff. Yeah, it's supposed to be better. I, I mean, you could be a virgin Bonnie and a virgin. an FBI list for sure. She <laughs> <laughs> is. <laughs> well, no, it's just like, I think about a lot. Every time I watch something like this, I'm like, okay, if I was her and I was that vampire, I definitely wouldn't want to drink the blood of, I'm cool with killing addicts and just killing them. I don't think that you have to drain them of all their blood to kill them. I think vampire blood for vampires is just like, not Gatorade, but you need it. It's like water, right? You can't have, you can't be away from liquid. Was it like four days or five days? Is it three days without water and you get really dehydrated and then you die? If you don't have any liquids, I can't remember kidnapping rules. Is it three days? It's like, oh, no, no. It's, it's gonna be, and it's gonna be completely no water, too. I think, right? So, like, if it's vampire blood, is like that, like, you need it to stay alive as a vampire. I don't well, know, they, how need many the, they need it for like sustenance. They need, and it's not just water, yeah, and I think, like, like the older too. they are, the le longer they can go without it, right? Yeah, well, they, yeah. get, like, they look like they get all shriveled up, like apple husk dolls or something, right? Until they get blood, like, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> The world or any of the vampires that have been under <laughs> for a while. They, they look like old and things. gross. Yeah, it's like they look old and gross. And then once they get blood, they're like hot again, I think. Mm -hmm. So I Yeah, yeah, they plump up. Yeah, they plump, plump up. up. <laughs> <laughs> and they go like and then they go, Woo, and I'm beautiful again. Yeah. I wrote um I wrote a short story in college once about a vampire that uh was very specific of who he attacked. And he only, and he was in Maine. I guess he was a vampire that had been made in Maine or somewhere in Canada. So he was really, uh, he preferred, it's kind of like, you know, when you have your favorite wine or your favorite cocktail, or your favorite soda, you're very, you know, partial to that certain kind of taste. And like, especially like if you like Coke, but you don't want Pepsi, it's not the same. It's like that kind of thing. So I wrote a short story about a vampire that could only drink the blood of people that had a lot of, had consumed a lot of maple syrup or had, so he was only attacking like IHOPs and Waffle Houses and like Jenny <laughs> and like houses. You are you are really wide tonight, Bone. That's all well, I know. Well, no, I didn't I'm like, yeah. I, if I was a vampire, I'd probably be kind of. It's like you have your choice between McDonald's. Wait, wait, and, like, wait, wait, wait. I would think that like he would do really well in Canada. Right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I would. Have, like, I would have based the story like you know <laughs> in Canada. Yeah, but it's also like, you know, I guess it just kind of depends too if your air level in your blood. Because just because you do a lot of pepper, just because you consume a lot of maple syrup, you could be diabetic. And I don't know what diabetic blood you like, especially if you're not medicated. <laughs> well, if you're medicated, know. does that change the like the bitterness? I don't know. I'm going to have to do all. I feel like there should be like a blood sommelier kind of, like, you know, the wine tasting. There should be like a blood tasting thing where you know, like, all the different levels. I don't know. I guess I just figured out my next story I'm writing. 
So, so there could be some kind of like vampire sommelier, right? Because right? <laughs> vintages and stuff. Right, because like, everybody's blood Let me show different. you to my cellar. Right. <laughs> everybody's blood tastes different. It's like, you know, you know, you know, love it. I think we're down. I think oh, yeah. we're all vampires that run a winery, but it's just blood and <laughs> wine, and you only get in by like a certain invitation. But it's done like a winery, so you get like a flight, a flight of blood, like little tiny houses of blood, and then you get to decide what kind you like, and then you get to take the human home that it came with. And it's a membership. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Anyway, anyway. Right. residential okay. membership, please. <laughs> I am. I mean, I think they come up with a new uh, franchise once vampirism is a real thing. Oh, oh my God, you guys are making me laugh way too much right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I was just picturing Jenna just opening a little bit. Jenna, old chap. Hey, at least they think it was interesting. At least you never know what I'm going to say. Every minute, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> also, I wonder, like, if you do a lot of Red Bull, does that mean the vampire gets like super duper energetic? Like, if you were, or if you went after someone like me who's like constantly, well, yeah. isn't, isn't your like, I thought, well, you know, I thought that like majority of the assist, you know, the, the systems within the body of a, a vampire are dormant, except for like, so the rest of that is irrelevant. Like oxygen, like what's happening? All that yeah. stuff. Is, and everything else is like, is like, like frozen none of that time. matters, you know. Yeah. Well, it depends on what store. I guess it just depends on what vampire world building you believe in. If you, you know, if you go more towards Vampire Diaries, Buffy Vampire Slayer, they have a different like. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're like, like they're like, <laughs> they're like queen new girl shit. We're not talking about that. We're talking about real vampires up in here. <laughs> but like real vampires, like I guess, like well, if you're going with dragon. By the way. Fun fact of this movie, they don't say the word vampire at all. In fact, they mentioned Dracula once. That's mm. it. They don't that's, that's, that's what the so kid dresses up as. It was funny. Yeah, they, they mentioned the name Dracula, but they don't say the actual word vampire. So I found that fascinating. Um, but yeah, I guess it just, I don't know. Like this, this movie is also, like you said, a lot about addiction, a lot about loneliness, a lot about um, just trying to find connections. But yeah. I do want I do wonder about this town too, because it's kind of like if you had someone okay, maybe this is more of a thing where you just have to have creative license, right? But if I saw some hot chick on a skateboard going down in the middle of the night, and also maybe she's got blood on her, I would I would raise I don't know if I would raise the alarm, but I've definitely talked to my friends about it. And it felt like she was sort of on the down low for most of this movie. Like I I guess you just if you want to be a vampire and live for a very long time, you kind of have not you don't want to draw attention to yourself. Right, you just have to be kind of like in plain sight, but it's only at nighttime. So I don't know how this town is during the day because she's not out during the day. So, well, you yeah. don't know. I mean, maybe nobody goes out really at night because they know that people die at night. That's true. That's true. It's like wild town. You don't want to be moseying around. Well, yeah, but also the I think that people that are out at night are really are the males, like. And the prostitutes, pretty much. Well, is that a, so I don't know a lot about Iranian culture. Is that is there curfews? Is it just not culturally acceptable to be a woman hanging out at night? I think it's a bit of both, but I, I would definitely, I'm no, I, I wouldn't be able to, you know, I don't know exactly. Yeah. What, what well, there's, a timeless, there's a timeless quality to this film too, because you don't really know right off the bat what year it is. No, and I love that. And I love that it's, I just love the whole black and white white aesthetic. It's got so much stuff yeah. that I love in it. It's just, uh, I just really like it. I think it's just a really good film. The music like kept, like as we, as I started listening to it and watching it, I was like, oh, this music's really good. And then I was like, I don't remember the soundtrack and like the score being this freaking good. And then it just kept getting better. And I was like, wow, this is like really well done. I'm still, I'm still like reeling in my mind the fact that, I, how, that you said how much it costs. Yeah, yeah. I was it just is. like, wait, what? It costs what? We need to do that. That's, that's how much it would cost if she got the real Madonna poster on that wall. That would be the licensing fee probably just for that, like, I mean, here's the thing with licensing fees in indie films. You have to be very careful, like, what you have just as props, what kind of sound sound cues you use if you're going to use a TV show or a movie that everyone knows. Like, when you look at a movie like Ready Player One, 
I don't know. I, Spielberg is the producer, and I don't think that movie would have been made without him because he would have he had to get licensees for every single pop culture reference in that film, and that is a lot of money. And also, they don't also cost all the same. Godzilla costs a lot more. Darth Vader costs a lot more than some of the other characters. So I was thinking that too with indie films. You know, you you very selective in your music and in everything because it adds up, right? It starts adding up with your budget. It's very rare that you stick to a budget when you make your own film. But this was one of those examples of someone who clearly loves movies making movies because mm -hmm. she cared about not just how it looks, but how it sounds. And I know that sounds silly and kind of obvious, but if you watch a lot of independent films, especially really, really independent films, like if you go on Freeverse or you go on Tubi or you go on, you know, a lot of those like free sites that have like all the films that are for free and even Amazon Prime. There's a lot in the indie horror film genre that you can watch that mm -hmm. clearly are crowdfunded movies, but you can tell they kind of forgot about the sound budget or they forgot about the music budget. It, it might look great. They might have great dialogue, but if you don't have good sound quality, and I mean like just Foley, like just the sound effects, just how people mm -hmm. talk, it sounds really rich. And also the Ooh. sound itself is, it, it's, it looks like it could happen. It looks like a movie movie and not just something somebody filmed with their like camcorder or whatever, or their iPhone. Like it's got good sound, but the music is distinct to this movie. And I think a lot of people are wanting when they have make a movie to get, you know, get songs everyone knows. Don't do that. Cause that's going to blow your budget. Yeah. Your original soundtrack. Cause if you have an original soundtrack, that's good like this. People will it's go. So good. It's just so good. I love this soundtrack, but I'm a, I love spaghetti Western music. I love, that kind of twanginess to it, but also I like the indie songs in here, but also it's just, it, it oh, yeah. cool. I'm like 25 when I was listening to this film. I'm 25. I'm wearing yeah. really skinny, skinny, skinny stovepipe jeans. I'm wearing red friggin' heeled boots. I got my lips on. I got my stripes on. I'm there. I'm back when, you know, I know exactly the club I was at. <laughs> the, most, <laughs> the, most romantic, the most romantic scene in this movie for me was when she goes to put a record on. And she's in his bedroom, right? And the posters and the lights, whatever. That's and the one I said earlier, where they play one yeah, night. earlier. Because it reminded me of high school when I had a crush on someone. And if you were lucky enough, and usually it was other girls, I was never like, I think maybe a couple times I was in other boys' bedrooms because I was their tutor. I mean, I shouldn't put that in quotes. I was a tutor. But like, <laughs> you, no, it's not like it is. It's not euphoria. People are, at least for me, in my generation and where I lived in Colorado, there was not a lot of sex being done by all the teens all the time. So it was, that was our level of foreplay. Like I always tell people like high fidelity does a great job of showing it. Mixed tapes were how we would flirt. So we would make a mixed tape for someone, a mixed cassette tape of all the songs that reminded me of them yeah. or yeah. something I wanted to say, but I was too shy to say it. You can, have a song that says like, a lot of Depeche Mode and Cure and Susie and the yeah. Band <laughs> on, on Concrete Blonde. Here's here's how I'm feeling about you. And if you're smart enough, usually girls got it, boys were clueless. But you know, if you were smart enough, you understood the social cues there. You understood the 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 hints, the nuances of oh, this song made me think of you. Oh, well then maybe you should read the lyrics. Like is that kind of thing. So when she goes to put the record on. And she puts the, she's just standing there and he slowly comes up behind her and it's very slow. Well, to first he geeks out on the, on the disco ball. The yeah, 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 that's the thing. Always have a disco ball for distraction and also for romantic lighting. I have one in my kitchen right now. Uh, but I just love that scene because it's so, it's Well, not, now we know where you like to get it on. I, yeah. exactly. Oh my God. It, that, it does have that real feeling of nostalgia, but just like that real, I don't know. It's so, it's but also of, just so charming. But also just so sweet. Yeah, sweet and charming, but not tacky. Like no. it's not, you know, it's got that coolness to it, which is really yeah, I, love, I love how subtle it is. I love how slow paced it is. It's just very romantic. I really love that scene. I watch it all the time. Like it's just like such a perfect scene. It's such a great movie. Yeah, anyway. I love the, I, the way it's shot, just the, the interaction between the two is just incredible. But like the, you know, all of those little things, like even the, you know, having the, the, the music, even the posters on the wall, all those things, it's all really interesting because it opens up all other avenues of discourse because not only that, like 
in Iran, you know, most Western materials are banned, like that you, that's illegal to have them. So, you know, it's also, there's all these little things that make it even more interesting as a story because, I mean, in Iran, you know, a lot, like, it's still women have to sit at the back of the bus, you know? It's like, like a little private rebellion things. of, like, a oasis. Yeah, like exactly. Like, it wasn't yeah, always if, like that. Is, if, she is, if she is that old, like, she's, she's kind of got like a teen soul though right because i mean look at that whole vibe right it's got that whole like teen kind of romance like you guys were all saying you know um but yeah she's like a hundred what something years old you know what i yeah. mean and she's, and she's dressing like me <laughs> she's yeah. saying records for lovers like me <laughs> i mean also when you're stuck at a certain age first of all lucky her right she she had to be made immortal at that age I always think of like, okay, here's another Bonnieism. So when I was like, I've always had eating disorders, so my weight have, has always fluctuated. And I remember having the thought process as a teenager of, I really hope I don't meet a, teen, a, a vampire because I'm not at the weight I want to be forever. And then I thought, how problematic that is that for women? Because we're never the weight we want to be. So when is the perfect time to push the immortality button on our bodies when we're never happy with them? So that was a moment where I was like, oh, she got to be cute when she died. There are other vampires that maybe they're not. Like, what if you pre nose job or she got to be cute when she died? Like, what if you also like, okay, but also also like, is, her hair, is her hair is her hair forever cut in that in that style? In the hairstyle. I do want to, yeah. So like, that's a pretty cute style, man. But also, does your hair grow? Because I feel like you stop growing when you're immortal. So is it just like one of those Barbie heads that if you cut the hair off, it's forever that? Or does it grow? Like, does it grow? Because when you're a vampire, you well, don't. Well, she cuts it. Does she wake up the next morning and it's like back to what no. it was again? Luxurious like this? Yeah, I do. Or is it just all hair? I think you could just. I think you could just, just have hair. I, I think, think we just, just need to find. We just need to find a vampire and just interview them. So we need yeah. to yeah. interview with a vampire. It's like different rules, different schools. You know what I mean? <laughs> what did you say? Yeah. Right? What did you say? I said like it's just different rules, different schools. You know. It's That's a like, way to think about it. Everyone has a different. Also, I think it was said in the comments earlier. You know, different cultures have different vampire lore and rules. So, like Chinese vampires are probably different than Mexican are, yeah. vampires, and Mexican vampires are going to be different than Middle Eastern. So it's it's also the culture that it's it's coming from. Um, but I do I do wonder about this movie a lot too. In the sense, oh, John just asked John Peters. Great comments are in the comment section. Uh, would all the good things you have said about the film uh, would that change if it was in color? I, I don't think it would be as amazing. I don't. The only thing I would add, and maybe this is too, like... I also friendly. am more partial to black and white anyway, so... I'm more so, partial to yeah. black and white, too. The only thing I would have done is anytime there was blood, make it red. That's it. But then it kind of becomes... I don't know. I think that would make it kind of cheesy. Too gimmicky? Maybe. Yeah, right. I think oh, that... Yeah. I think it would be a different... I think it would be a different film if it was in color. Yeah. Like, it yeah, I don't color. color. Like so, the, the 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 kind of the kind of atmosphere and the vibe and the yeah. that kind of you know real emanating feeling that you have when you watch it. I don't think that would be there if it was in color. I think it would be a different. Because the way the be, shadows are, like everything is just yeah. That, that everything is everything is dark. And vibe in the movie. It's dark about shadows. And lurking, like very you know like yeah. It's, and that's also like what's happening. And it's a play on shadows. I think also because of her age, it shows like maybe that mirrors black and white films. Interesting thing though, is in um, the late eighties when uh, Ted Turner started TNT, the movie channel, uh, classic movie channel, T, I guess it was TCM. Um, because he is kind of like, I don't want to keep talking about Elon, but he's like a rich dude with a lot of money. He could do whatever he wants. He decided to, do something called colorization of old films. So he colorized a bunch of black and white films like Casablanca and Citizen okay. Kane, like these movies that are very iconic because he was just an old dude with a lot of money. He's like, why not? I own a movie channel. So he why went not? ahead and colorized all these and you can, you can find them on YouTube. You can find them on streaming, I'm sure. But when you would see Casablanca or you would see Citizen Kane or you would see all these movies, like It's a Wonderful Life that were black and white, suddenly colorized, it was weird because it was kind of like rotoscoping where it was just not quite the colors you would imagine. And also it was too bright or too weird or just distracted you. But, you know, there's a whole bunch of generations of people that have never, they weren't around for black and white movies when they came out or they don't even watch them. They don't even know what they are. 
sadly, uh, that when they I think of the Wizard of Oz, like going when when I watched it completely, and then when I well, watched it in the duel, I was like, whoa. Hey, yeah, well, also it starts black and white, and the color is in Oz, so it's kind of like. But that was a choice for that filmmaker. But also, that was in Technicolor color, and Technicolor yeah. color was like talk about being on acid. That Technicolor, that's what I love. Technicolor, is beautiful. yeah, Technicolor is beautiful. I think La La Land didn't they shoot that in Technicolor to mimic the old so. school yeah. But that is a good question. You know, you see a movie in black and white like this that is not an old timey movie. You know, it's not. It is timeless in how it's presented, but it's a movie that was made recently. So you do kind of wonder what would that be in color? And I think you're right. I think it would take away from everything. Like, I think you just wouldn't, it wouldn't set the mood like it does. Mm. Um, yeah. But- and I've, I've seen some films that are in black and white that didn't need to be in black and white. And I've seen films that are, you know, yeah. you know, where I've gone, well, if this, if the story pertains to it, then I think, you know, if, if it's an extension of the, of the, the idea, then it works if it's just there for purely to be like oh just because well and it also it, it's also reflective of the fact that she is kind of like an angel of death for like the bad you know so there's also like the light and dark sort of yeah dichotomy and, exactly. going on there. and because there's so like I, I've heard people you know there's so like there's a lot happening but a, a, not a lot at the same time yeah and so I feel like all of these things that are built into way that it's shot to the way that the coloring is to the sound it all adds you know just all this rich texture to what's happening it also is the choice of the cinematographer and the movie maker because obviously too just because we see a movies in color doesn't mean that that can't also be mixed up to be very distinct what Wes Anderson perfect example he mm-hmm. really pays attention to color palette. Mm-hmm. And you can tell yeah, West totally. the movie, apart from all the others, just from how the color is. And they, even though I mentioned Twilight, I just rewatched all of them for fun the other day because I was like, mm-hmm. are they really going to be? Um, they are. But I still watched them all. And the color is subdued on purpose. So when you look at it, you're like, why is everything in this weird, like, blue, purpley, like, kind of subdued everything's in this? It takes place in Seattle, I think, or at least in the Pacific Northwest. But it like the filmmaker consciously wanted to have not bright colors. They wanted it, yeah. everything to look like it's constantly about to rain. So everything's kind of subdued. So it is interesting when you look at filmmakers and the choices they make for color for their films. I think Tarantino, David mm. Lynch is a perfect example. I mean, David Lynch did a whole episode that was black and white. Mm. Um, for the most recent Twin Peaks revival um, that was about the atomic bomb that was done, it's so beautiful. Like if you watch it, I don't even think there's any dialogue. It's one episode, it's a gorgeous episode, mm. but it's like a prequel kind of story about Twin Peaks, about the about Laura Palmer's mom as a daughter or as a little girl. And it was just one of those things where I'm like, oh my God, this was amazing. Also David Lynch could do whatever he wants and it's gonna be great. But Eraserhead's in black and white and that's a David Lynch movie that's very atmospheric and very creepy. I could not watch that if that was in color, that would be horrifying. So at least in black and white, it's still horrifying, but I don't want to see that baby in color, that creepy baby. So yeah, no. movies that are like, yeah, that's, that's part of the movie is that it is black and white for a reason. You don't want to go colorizing it because just for the hell of it. So now yeah. I feel like a total jackass for saying the red, the blood should be red. I take it all back. Don't touch this. <laughs> <movie. laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, sorry. Um, oh no. <laughs> are you okay? Yeah, I just had a weird, like, ooh. Just, I'm like, sorry you're not feeling well, Renee. If I was a vampire, I would make you immortal so you wouldn't be sick. I, I'm feeling, I'm I'm not feeling that bad. It's honestly, I'm feeling okay. It's just, like, throat noise is weird. Throat that would be the one trade-off. Throat, 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 throat nose. I mean, not noise. I would, love, I would love to be a vampire and not have to ever worry about, you know, COVID. No, 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 I, I just want to roll around, like, not have to. I'd never be tired. The only thing I would want is a, a good exit strategy because I don't want to be around for a thousand. I want to be fast and do lots of cool shit. Like I've I always want to learn. Yeah, I just want to learn a bunch of languages. I want to not die. I want to be able to kill people that are bad and, and get away with it. But also, I I am a commitment phobe. I the longest relationship I had was with, was with my oh, dog. I, I just want to go. I want to go and kill a bunch of shit and be really fast. Oh my have goodness! Of, have lots of dudes think I'm a babe. I just want to be like. Oh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of dudes do think you are a babe. 
You are a vampire. You don't need a vampire. It's like, I don't need to be one to see that. You know, like the chicken, Um, you know, like I want to be like Tomb Raider style or like. And oh, I see. You want to, you want to be a badass femme babe that like runs around kicking dudes' asses like Resident Evil and like stuff like that. I do wonder if my lifestyle would really drastically change that much if I was immortal or if I just watch a lot more television. I probably do the same, but not be tired. I probably live somewhere else. I don't think we're like super rich, right? Because we assume that all 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 vampires are rich, right? Well, not always. (laughs) I'm going to be. I'm going to be a bougie vampire. Something you need to remember. You have to have like some human under your control to be your banker. Because you well, can't be immortal and rich because you got to hide your money. You got to like make sure oh, yeah, you're you got to find a white dude for that. That's yeah, you, you can't go into crypto. You can't be a crypto bro and be a vampire. You can't do any of that. It's got to be like doubloons or something. Like you got to have something that like will always. I don't know. I'll just make people, I'll just make dudes work for me. I don't care what they do. I'll just, just, or just, just like um, hypnotize them and glamour them. And then yeah, exactly. like. I just want to sleep, watch all the TV I want, and shop and shop and shop and eat and eat and have sleepovers okay, and be super, super um, cool. And travel wherever okay. I want. Exactly. But you know what? I would miss the sun and I would miss food. You yeah, I would. Yeah, as long as I can see it eating. and not burn. But I would love food. That's going to be sad. Yeah, food would be the worst. Yeah, food's gone. Alcohol can't do anything to you. And uh, I don't miss the sun. I'm the one person in LA who wants the sun gone. Remember that oh, Simpsons episode where Mr. Boone? I like the sun. I don't have to be in it. I love it. I don't it. want it. I don't want I it at all. To see it. No. I like to be able to see it. I when I lived in England, I got very depressed, and the, the not having sun was very very detrimental. I'm cool with just a bunch of LED candles lit everywhere. That's enough. I don't well, I don't it. like it either, and I thought I would love to live in the dark, but I didn't. I um. I yeah, didn't. I think I might be one of the few people that could be okay with that. I don't get. I get depressed in sunlight instead of without it. So I think it's just reverse or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, get, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't want to get rid of the it's sun because then all life would die. I mean, I don't want that. But I mean, I just don't want to be in it. Yeah. So it's kind yeah. of like, yeah, I just need perpetual shade. That's basically all I'm always looking for. Perpetual twilight. Uh, yeah, I would not do the fact that I'm like full goth in North Hollywood. The sun most of the time is. A good reason why as a vampire I would go straight north. I would not I would not stay down here. I can't be an LA vampire. I don't think I so I don't know though. I could clean up this city pretty fast. I think North Hollywood would be a different North Hollywood if I was Yeah, I wish okay. I was like the chicken the hunger dude. <laughs> uh you would do really well in the hunger actually. <laughs> I could see you I mean here's the thing about the hunger. That's a very beautiful uh movie about vampirism, but also what happens when you're paired with a vampire that's dying, and but you're not, and you gotta go mm. find a new lover. Also, David Bowie dying, which is just horrifying to like yeah. see that degradation happen, but. Well, uh, I love you know, Love is Left Alive, like that, that kind I of. I love like, that movie. We should watch that. that. We should put that on our docket to watch sometime. That's, oh yeah, uh, I, I've done it with uh, where did I, I? I did it for Movie Night Extravaganza. Mm. I yeah, it's it's that too, my ideal they're like my ideal vampire couple, but Me also so is, um, what they do in the shadows. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love that too. I just a got a, um, I just got a, um, a what do you call it? A car air freshener from the what we do in the shadows TV show. That is not what I thought you were gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think I was gonna say? Oh my that gosh! Not- I, don't know, I was like waiting for like I just got it, and I was like. I'm like, where's the car? Where's the car? It was a car air freshener, and I was like, oh. <laughs> it's a little bat and it's got you know it's got um him going bat and it's like from the it was really cute. And it it cost two dollars. <laughs> I so I have to tease you because that was just so funny. It's fine. It's all right, you know. That's I'm teasing everyone tonight. I'm can sorry. I can I put on yeah, a yeah. roster um another couple vampire movie that Not I right now though, not in the middle of the show. <laughs> Wait, what? What happened in the middle of the show? Not in the what? middle of the episode. What am I not supposed to do? <laughs> oh, give give a list of films. No, no, no. One. Okay, one. one. Oh, I'll allow one. <laughs> uh, uh, Kiss of the Damned with uh, Vilo oh, Vincimiglia. Yeah. Vilo, uh, my- it's been a long what? time. Since Vilo I- Vincimiglia. Uh, he, he is so good in that movie, and it's such an interesting movie about 
uh, a couple. And I've also seen it. about addiction. I think addiction. It's been a long time since I've seen it. It's also, a, um, I think one of the Argentos made it, right? Like one of his kids made, not Aja, but I think one of the Argento kids made it. So it's very Argento-esque in that sense. The music's which, amazing. Which, which film are you talking about? It wasn't it um, Alexander Cassavetes? Yeah. Kiss at the Dam. Oh, Cassavetes, not Argento. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, my God. You're oh, my in God. trouble. <laughs> Here's the thing. There's only know, maybe, where are you? There's no problem. I wouldn't know. Hey, I wouldn't know. Like, I'm just... <laughs> okay, we're, we're really rogue tonight, guys. We really rogue. No, we're still talking about vampires. Hey, I'm, at least I'm not talking about maple syrup. Sorry, I have spring break brain right now. I'm all over the place. I, I have a lot. And lost it forever brain. And yeah, we, we also covered a lot of topics. And I also talked about, I explained drugs to people that may want to know that hopefully won't sue us. And uh, yeah, so we covered a lot of territory in this. <laughs> in this oh, I did remember one thing that I did want to say. That's what okay. I, I remember <laughs> something. I got like taken away by these waves of excitement from you. Uh -huh. Lost like what I what I what I was meant to be thinking about. Ah. Um, I wanted to say talk about the ending of the film because for me, like, was you know where there's that d distinct like moment where you know Arish no Arash sorry notices like you know the, the cat's obviously there in the apartment and yeah. oh, the cat was um, together. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, you know, they, they're in the car and they stop in the car and he gets out and he's visibly angry and he, like, kind of kicks the dirt or whatever and then he just decides to get back in anyway and kind of, like, and then they just kind of look at each other and they kind of drive off. And I like... Because, yeah, okay. because even though it's, like, kind of like a like a shitty ending, like, like okay, his dad got killed and all this stuff and, like, but all, at the same time, like, yo, like, all the dude's problems are pretty much taken care of now. They got all kinds of money. And like they got all kinds of jewelry, and they got a car, and they got a cat, and they've got like this wonderful life to embark on now. And like, is yeah, he well, going to make him a vampire? Like, are they going to have like vampire yeah, babies? Yeah, vampire babies. Yeah. Well, because I was thinking as well, like I was kind of like, you know, it's, you know, like a vampire. I guess is like it's kind of like a force of nature or whatever. And I was thinking like, you know, it's kind of like if a hurricane like comes and you know destroys your house or whatever. Like, you, it's not really a choice like to to like you know to forgive the hurricane. You know what I mean? You just kind of accept it and move on. And that's kind of how I'm, I I was looking at it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like, it's just, it's a force of nature. You don't, there's, there's no choice there. You just move, go forward with it. And then, and then I, but I also felt like what you said, like about how, you know, now they've got money, they've got all those, these things now. It's essentially like, you know, the girl was there protecting, you know, like kind of protecting the women of Bad City. And now there's kind of been this like conscious, like move towards essentially becoming like, I guess, the vigilante for Arash and, and killing off all the disease and badness in his life. Like that, that her focus has shifted from others to Arash. Like, and you know, that kind of, I guess that's a part of the dark romance sort of yeah. idea. Of it. It's like, we don't know, you know, what is going to happen now that they leave? Like, is she going to just be like, that's the end now. I'm not going to go do that stuff. Cause now I've got my dude and I'm cruising. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you know she's old. So yeah. she's. Also, and then they're gonna have vampire sex. But this isn't her, <laughs> this isn't her first rodeo, so she's probably this is probably lover number ninety eight. Maybe, but, yeah. I, I mean, be. I really feel like it's. I feel like it's not. Like I feel like their meeting is very, I very, like it's I feel it's like very she, like. Yeah. What's that word? She like was, very she innocent. Not, she wasn't like seductive. She wasn't like she was trying. She no. was very like. Like almost shy in that room with the disco ball and everything. Oh, yeah, else. and the walking alone like, on the felt like a like first. A, it felt like a first sort of. It like, felt like. Yeah, that's how I felt. I I yeah. felt like it was a it was a very much a like she didn't interact with anyone on that level previously. Like, and when they meet each other when they're walking on the street, like there is a very like, kind of like, youthful like shyness and and you know she kind of doesn't know what to do and even when he moves forward and he's like hugging her she doesn't run away but she doesn't know what to do either she kind of just stands there and might this, not also might not like also be shy she could just be protective of herself because if you've lived that long you've probably been broken hearted constantly so that could also be just her being protective and yeah, not but there's so, i guess there's like kind of a i don't know i feel like there's a there's a vulnerability there though when oh, she's no, definitely Definitely. Like, yeah. If someone, if it was another man coming out to her, I feel like she would have just ripped his head off. Yeah. Like there's yeah, a, there's, yeah, there's, 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 there's like, 
It feels like the first time. It oh, feels like the first time, you know what I mean? Yeah, it feels like, like the first time that she's like experiencing this this feeling that she doesn't understand and she's standing or maybe there. She doesn't understand it and she hasn't felt it in forever. Because there is that moment oh, too where you've been like, if you've been heartbroken a lot, you're going to be a little more reserved. You're going to be a little less, unless you're just going off the rails, which is also fine. But some of us just don't do that and we're a bit more, uh, you know, closed off or I wouldn't say closed off, just more. We're uh, also assuming that vampires can love, you know? Yeah, true that. True Ooh, that. Harsh. Harsh reality check from Jenna. Sorry. <laughs> vampires can love Jenna. You just <laughs> <ruined it. laughs> they were human ones. Humans feel love. Are you just talking they're all yeah, second? And then she's been around as long as you said she's been around. Like, like yo, like well, that's she, that's why I, I had that. I don't get the feeling that she thinks humanity is very great. No, and well, that's, that's I'm not a hundred and whatever, but I'm getting up there. Let me mm -hmm. tell you, I understand where she's coming from, but I don't. I still have the capability and capacity to fall in love. In fact, I still do. I just get more and more insecure about it as I go on because I'm not good at relationships. So I feel like vampires, maybe they're not great at relationships because also maybe they don't make everyone they fall in love with vampires. And you get to watch your human age out, which can't be fun. And you probably go through a lot of people. And also a lot of vampires can be very much like... You can just kill them though when you don't like them anymore. <laughs> Renee, Renee, that is not how you should break up as a vampire. You should let them live their lives. You should only kill them if they're horrible, horrible, horrible. No, I've Renee, got the point. Oh. <laughs> There's how many billion people on this planet, man? You're done, Darren. Sorry, I didn't like the way you folded your clothes. <laughs> You're out. You're out. I know. I feel like it will just be yeah, a very. I feel like this I feel like she's scared of humans, but I don't know whether it's, I, I don't know. Yeah, I felt like she's scared of humans, definitely. Or like been burnt by humans in the past. Or maybe she's scared of hurting them if she falls in love with one. That's the fun thing yeah. about this movie. There's not a lot of dialogue and there's no backstory. No. So you don't it's know. Be 100. You know, it's like dogs. It's very you know? vibey. Like, and, and I love that, but I love, the, I love that about it because you can like build this whole background or have yeah, this. Yeah, because I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, it's like dogs, right? Like dogs are however much in human years. Like she might be like whatever in vampire years, but really she's just like in her 20s, vibing. You know, in the no, that is true. Room, you know what I mean? You, uh, I mean, just because <laughs> that's why she. Vampire. That's why she hasn't like gone out there. This is her first, like you know. Well, I mean, just because you turn into a vampire doesn't mean you turn you change drastic personalities. If you're kind of an introvert, before well, we don't know if she was born one or if she was turned into one. I don't think mm. you can. Mm. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Renee says so. I said, you know, that's a snap. <laughs> I know, no, Renee, there's rules and I know them all. No, there's, it depends on the culture because Chinese vampires are created very differently. <laughs> no, exactly. But what I'm saying is, is, yeah, there are vampires that have no origin oh in the sense goodness. that they're not turned. Yeah, but they're, like, they're yeah. We can, yeah. we can go on for hours talking about how vampires. I mean, this is a good, this is a good story. This should show you right there that you can oh, tell a movie is good. When we want more story, we want more. We, we want, want more. I want to what happened. We want a prequel or a sequel or a whatever because it's such a good story. We fell in love with this character so much. We're like, no, I want more, and that's good storytelling. That's good filmmaking. So you know, yeah. that's, I think that's fine to like. And also, this is how fan fiction happens. So I mean, we could all yeah, write it. Is, it is. It is. So, I mean, so, so has this director done anything recently? Yeah, well, and I've got to say I haven't like the Bad Batch was the follow up. Did you not like it? I so I, I haven't did. seen that first one. I haven't seen it, but like I know that you know I'm not. I don't really want to judge off reviews, but like I know that you know there's been like I know that didn't get great reviews when it was out, the Bad Batch. But I haven't seen it, so I have I don't have an opinion. You know what I mean? Did yeah. it come out during COVID? Was it recent? Like, did it come out? No, it came out in 2016. Oh. And I remember, I, do, I, I, I remember, like, the, the, um, what do we call it? The poster is like, everyone remembers that poster. It's got like a, a kind yeah, of like the yellow, the yellow shorts. With, like, right now. Yeah, it's um, got Jason Momoa in it and Giovanni Ribisi, oh. Keanu, Keanu Reeves. This and, is uh, so big and familiar to me, but I didn't know. Yeah, this is it. The Bad Batch. That's the one. Yeah, that's it. But yeah. okay, yeah, I, don't, I don't remember if I've ever seen it. I remember the poster very vividly, I but I remember I have, seen it. I have seen it. I have a vivid memory of why I've seen it. Uh, I oh. saw it because 
uh, there it was the first year of COVID lockdown, the first lockdown, and it got on net uh, Amazon Prime or Netflix. I can't remember which. And it was a friend that I was sort of like, it was a friend of a friend who's like super popular and super. It's like a hipster birthday party that we we're doing a watch. Like you know, mm -hmm. you can watch it with a bunch of people, but watch it's not video. video. It's just you have a chat room, and then this it'd be like this where you watch a video and then you have a chat room to talk. But it mm -hmm. was. I was so insecure because it was a group of people that were like super hipster, cool Hollywood types. And I was like, oh shit. And this movie is really strange, by the way. It is such an, I don't even know how to explain the movie. It felt like it had elements of Mad Max in it, but also elements of like fear and loathing, but also some sci-fi weird stuff and horror stuff and fantasy stuff. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And all the cameos, you're like, holy crap, what am I watching? And so, you, and also, I don't know if it's a great movie to watch 100% sober. So if you've got an edible or wine or just, I don't know, okay. watch it. Maybe if you don't do drugs or alcohol, maybe just watch it when you're really sleep deprived. That might be the same kind of level. And it was a weird film. Like it was one of those films where I'm like, no, I feel bad for, and I was a film reviewer at the time and I didn't even want to review it for CNET. Because I love I love the movie creator. I love the director, but I don't want to like, it's a weird movie. So I highly recommend watching it. If you just want something very weird. To watch. I'll definitely watch it. I love a weird, I love, I love a good weird curveball. Yeah. It's just, it's, a, it's one of those movies too, where it's like, you know, when you watch something and then you're like, what did I just watch? I have no idea what this is. What, what did I just watch? That's mm -hmm. that. Um, and it's, it's, it's weird too. Cause it's like you said, I think it's pretty polarizing. Like I was just going to read the synopsis uh the plot summary yeah, yeah so the bad batch follows arlen after she's left a texas wasteland fenced off from civilization while trying to navigate the unforgiving landscape arlen is captured by a savage band of cannibals led by the mysterious miami man played by momoa um with her life on the line she makes her way to the dream that's keanu reeves's character and says mm -hmm. as she adjusts to as she adjusts to life in the bad batch arlen discovers that being good or bad mostly depends on who you're standing next to. It is a, it's kind of like a Furiosa. It's kind of like a Mad Max. Yeah, it's very Mad Maxy. It's very, it's Mad Max, but like, like a dusty Blade Runner too. It's like very, it's very Mad Maxian, but like also you're like, what's going on? I don't understand what's happening. And I watched it once with that group of like cool kids, and I was like, I don't know what's going on. And then I watched it a second time, and I still didn't know what's going on. And then I watched it a third time on Edibles. That didn't help. And then I watched it a fourth time. I don't understand what's going on. It's like, it was like really into well, it. Well, then. Well, yeah, I don't think you're going to spend any time on this, Bonnie. You're not really selling it for me. Here's the thing. If there's a movie that's confusing to me, I, just like who I date, I don't give up on them. And I, I try really hard uh -huh. to understand where they're coming from. So why don't you watch that's, a movie that's like that? It's okay to just give the fuck up, girl. I don't know. So really it's okay to just walk away. Yeah, when, when you get to, when you get to the third time, cost some fallacy, like walk away, just walk away. I'm like, I'm not like that Kenny Rogers song, like the gambler. I don't know when to hold them or walk away or when to run. I don't know. I just stay. <laughs> I just stay put. <laughs> yeah, when you get to when you get to a film and it's the fourth time watching, that that's time to walk away. That that's yeah, you just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> I, would I would be the girlfriend of that's the violin. Like okay, so that's like me. I tried to watch, and everyone loves this fucking movie. I tried to watch it four times and I just fell asleep every single time I tried what is to watch it. Is it Saltburn? Is it Saltburn? No, it's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or whatever. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. I in fell asleep. I, I tried four times to watch it and I just kept falling asleep. I just got mad that they wrote what happened. I just got mad that they wrote I just got mad that they wrote what happened to the, to the, the man's family. Every man loved it and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> first, of all, Bruce, first of all, Brad Pitt could never beat up Bruce Lee. And second of all, don't make the Manson family not kill people. Like the wrong people. Like that was- Thanks for the, thanks was, for the spoilers here, Bonnie. <laughs> well, you don't know unless you know a lot of Manson history, the Bruce Lee What thing if I was gonna like, you know, what if I was gonna like watch it a fifth time? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like I really needed to take a nap or something. That's also a Tarantino film and I think Tarantino likes to make things that are polarizing sometimes and that yeah. movie was definitely I felt like we it. hadn't heard from him in so long that I was like this is your Tarantino movie like where's Kill Bill 3 mister oh no, can we get back to like death proof yeah yeah well, that's, I don't know but anyway yeah that's a movie that I think Anna created an interesting movie at least it's not boring and I don't think the filmmaker that made this movie and Bad Batch and other stuff 
Uh, she makes another movie about an alien, like a girl that gets out of a mental hospital Ooh. who's an, who might be a demon, but you don't know. And she's got, she hooks up with uh, Kate Hudson, ironically enough, who plays a stripper. Um, and basically, what is this movie? Let me look it up. It's uh, it's it's recent. Is it, is it the one that came out in like 21? Is it a uh, Mona Lisa and the Blood Moon? It is. It is. That's what it's called. Mona Lisa and the Blood Room, Blood Moon, and it Moon. came out in 2021. I have not seen it. So full disclosure, that's on my list to watch. But oh, it's interesting to see Kate Hudson in it because she's you're so used to her in mainstream like rom coms and stuff. And this mm. is not rom com at all. And this movie is all kinds of crazy as well, just from like just from the trailer. It's a girl with unusual powers escapes from a mental asylum and tries to make it on her own in New Orleans. Um, and yeah, a hardworking single mother, AKA, I think that's Kate Hudson as the stripper, meets a mysterious patient mm -hmm. who's from a psychiatric hospital and has supernatural powers. How could she use her to make a quick buck? That's all. And it says, uh, however, the duo's invention catches the attention of a policeman and is soon threatened by the police. There's like a police thing. Whatever. So, yeah, and it's a guy from um, it's a guy from like, um, what do you call it? From like Pineapple Express and like, um, all those hot tub time machine movies. Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's like in this. Cop. He's in the Seth Rogen group of comedians. Yeah, he's the cop. He's, yeah, he's a character actor that's in a lot of those movies. Mm. I haven't seen it yet, but it looks interesting. And also, I'll watch anything this movie maker makes. I don't care. I love this movie so much that she's already got me hooked. She's right? Starts, she's mm -hmm. she's piqued our interest. If she yeah, starts yeah. Cult, I'm in it. If she starts uh, an MLM, I'm in. I don't care. Like, this is a person that oh, I think. Wait, is really? Cult. No, don't do that to yourself, girl. No, what I'm saying mm -hmm. is if she starts a cult, I'm in because I respect her her brain so much that I know everything she touches. It's going to be interesting. It may not be the best thing or Broken everything. like a true cult follower. <laughs> <laughs> what I look like the poster girl for a cult follower. Well, no, but the sentence you just said was like straight out of a call. I know it's so bad. Every time it really was. Okay, so we're gonna start planning our rescue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. our yeah. intervention. Let's just say that I could get if someone has enough charisma and talent. I will, say, I will say, you know, Bonnie, you do have like a, you have like a, yeah. Go yeah. ahead. We can say it. <laughs> I have a personality that's thirsty for love and attention. And oh, I no, no. You get, you get very, very excited about people. <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert. I, didn't I, didn't say that. I mean, you, Jenna, you've gone to dinner with me multiple times. You know what I'm like at dinner, and I get excited about just everything we talk about okay, at dinner. So oh. this, this lady will have, like, a 25-minute conversation with our waiter. Like oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 to the point that I actually said, "Hey, Bonnie, I think he has to work." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've done that with multiple waiters, where they're like, "Because we'll be in the middle of something, a topic that's interesting," and uh, the waiter will come by and I'm like, "Oh, what do you think of blah blah blah?" Uh, <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, I never thought of that, or I never heard of it." I'm like, well, "Let me tell you the history of it." Like she I, started, she started telling our waiter about like rapes and stuff. Like, oh yeah, yeah that was right because he said he went to one, but he's a Gen Zer, and I'm like, really? Did they inject ephedrine into your Capri Sun and have you drink it? Because that's a rape drink. And he's like, what? And then we just like, yeah, that was the whole. Word. And I was just sitting there being like, okay, I mean, eat my dinner, eat my soup. <laughs> First. Here's the thing. I don't get out much. So when I am in public, I tell oh, you're you. you're fun, Bonnie. Me. I'm just teasing you. You're fun. <laughs> I know. But I just get excited to, to connect with people on any yeah. level. So I will overshare with the greeter at Walmart. It's always like everyone's got their own little thing. Like I turn into a 12-year-old when I go out. So don't worry. Like I, I, went, I went and had brunch with my friend yesterday and it was like, um, like they, <laughs> she ordered a, I don't know, a cashino or something. And the lady was like, what do you want? And I was like, I'm going to have a chocolate milkshake, please. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and this is the second time in maybe oh my God, like I'm so gonna go, mm, I want a chocolate milkshake. And both of my friends were like both times, two different people at different places, and they were both like, you are just so cute. I'm like, well, I don't drink coffee. And like I, I, when I, I, I grew up really poor. When I go out for dinner, it's like a big deal. Yeah, I'm me like, too. I want to see where my money goes. So yeah. I'm like, give me the biggest, most extravagant thing you can give me. I want a big ass milkshake with a big old cherry on top. Give it to I me. I mean, I want I want fancy cocktails when I go out and 
Jenna seen it firsthand. I'll order the weirdest stuff on oh, the menu. I get crazy pop cocktails. And then send like it back because it tasted terrible. But only one time. I only sent it back once because there was a weird, weird taste to it. Again, this is why I can't be a vampire. I think I would send humans back too many times. Because they would be like, like sorry, this one isn't up to taste standards. This one's too citrusy. This one's too sweet. I sweet. love another. <laughs> this one tastes like bad beer. I want I want a different <laughs> image. Hello. Oh. Oh. oh, George. See, this is why I'm getting vampire sommelier. Because I need I need someone to tell me the right human to bite. Because I'm telling you, it's a minefield of bad blood out there. I don't want to. Well, know. it might be we just have to eat hippies, you know, like people who are on organic diets. Oh, God, and no. Do you know what the BO would be like on that? Do you know that vampires can smell? No, like, if they're giving it to us, like, I'm not <laughs> eating them or whatever. Like, whatever. Like, just give it to me in a restaurant. No, I eat really anything. healthy. And I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I said yeah. Hippie, not vegan. Yeah. There's a difference. Hey, I, I heard it to what I meant, I just meant like the generalized stereotypical term of hippie. I should, I should have. Oh no, I'm talking about that. like hippie, hippie. I grew up with. I mean, hippie. like farm to table. You know, I'm talking like people who spend good money on decent produce and like if they're gonna eat meat and chicken, they I, do that. Full I mean, on I had to break up with a guy because he didn't believe in deodorant, but he only used those rocks. Remember those rocks that were like yeah. crystals, and they were just like. A yeah, I remember that. Yeah, they yeah, don't. They don't back work. To the Neanderthal days, bro. Like, come on. They yeah. don't work. Yeah. yeah. But you know, it is a thing they don't really talk about in this movie, but a lot of other vampire lore is their senses are heightened. So you yeah, have the senses. And also I mean, the yeah, speed. well, there's the part where you know she's listening to his heartbeat and then that yeah. takes over the sound. I know that was sweet. So maybe he's so good. Maybe he smells like pine trees and brute. Well, and I just still I still wonder if she had turned him in because it doesn't show much of like what she did with him after that scene. Like we don't know what they yeah. did. And then yeah, all they the would just fell asleep. Or... Somebody, and then after he <laughs> tells somebody that he's tired, he says he's tired, which sort of in, seems like maybe she did take a little sippy sip. I do wonder though, because like in those mm -hmm. and let the right one in, she can't make that companion a vampire because she needs someone to be her protector during the day. Right. So they yeah. can't they can't do that. So the kid is gonna grow up to be a man. And eventually die, and then she's gonna have to replace well, him. Well, you gotta get another protector. You gotta get another familiar. I feel like you can have a staff, right? Like you can have like a vampire. Yes, you can attach yourself to like a family. Yeah, you know. a really rich family, and you, then you just follow the bloodline, and then like they remain your protector, and you're like their their well, adventurer. Each time, each time they grow up, that's what their job is. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah just latch on to like a rich family or a mafia family or something. Something that you know they've got protectors already built in and a financial plan. Well, that's what they have in like you know in in like those Korean things that I watch. That's what they have. They have like families that have been looking after goblins and demons and shit. I know. Shit. I <laughs> wonder about that. It's like I always wanted to be in the Talamasca, which is like the Watchers in right. um, yep. books and the Mayfair Witches and all of that. And I know sometimes you're born into it, but I think it's like the FBI for them, where you have to like uh, you have to go through an agent school. Well, you also have to have some sort of affinity of some sort of talent of supernatural power, don't you? Yeah, to be able Aaron to. Lightner, yeah. Aaron Lightner, who was like the main character person from the Telemosca, he That's true. he had he had like an affinity for something. Remember, didn't he? That's have right. Like, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. You have, have to have some it. sort of like affinity for like supernatural or, things, or or yeah, like yeah. a blessing, yo. <laughs> yeah, or you have to like be some sort of an empath or at least some connector. Some and I think, thing, yeah. And then the some Buffy, little, like Giles. more important than just a straight up human. Yeah, but like in the Buffy lore, Giles is a true. watcher, but he's just like a dude that knows stuff. He's super smart. He's like super smart and shit. He he's like, witch, though. he was a witch in training, though. Yeah, he's yeah, true. true. So, but he's still got skills. I mean, like, where I feel like we're coven, so we're halfway there. So I just have to figure out where on LinkedIn I can like into that job where I can like follow a vampire around for, and get paid for, for it. For reals. Um, one thing I did want to say, which I thought as well that I liked about this, in is that like all the 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 character, the father who's a drug addict and like he's a heroin addict. Yeah. And um, Harsh. I love that it was very like, um, it was just like kind of fucking with the norm of what you think a heroin addict is because like, yeah. When I, remember when I first watched it, I was kind of like, what's wrong with this guy and then and then it kind of dawned on me oh he's an addict because like yeah. he's not a skinny dude he's pretty chunky you know like yeah. for a yeah. junkie you can like, be you know the way he's kind of like leaning and stuff at first I just thought he was an old man who was sick and then I realized oh hang on he's a heroin junkie and I was like oh I guess heroin junkies do exist that aren't like 
heroin junkie. Yeah, but I think the problem is that is it because of the '90s heroin chic models and yeah, but I've never even no, but I've never actually seen like a, a heroin addict that's not like quite unhealthy and like doesn't look like they've eaten and I've never really seen like maybe it's just me but like never seen a heroin addict no no like not overweight just normal weight even you know it's always like you know I'm just talking like like I eat and I'm a healthy weight like just yeah Uh, it's it's always seen it's always been you know the 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 image you always see and even on the street that I've seen is often you know quite you know thin very you know they're hungry like very you know you don't often see like oh they're not hungry yeah no you know know what I mean like they're not they look like I mean they look hungry to us like I'm like oh because heroin heroin replaces food well that's what I mean and this this guy looks like he's eaten every meal for the last month you know what I mean like so I've dated a few so I know you could be well well, no, but I, mean, but I mean the imagery she chooses to show that it's it's, it's a different thing. And she's like, because that's not what you see, you know, when you're when you're looking at a lot of a lot of films, like that's not the image you see. That's you a stereotypical see. image. Yeah. That you yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. Like you don't a you don't often see it being like someone who you can equate with, like just being like it's my dad that I have dinner with at night. You know, like, he looks like, yeah, like, that kind of stuff. And I think of like requiem for a dream type mm. attitude type like. Yeah, like I mean, yeah, I mean Jared. Like, it makes me sick to say it, but like Jared Leto, when he's not like fanging in the arm and all gross, he's like really attractive in that film, and it's disturbing <laughs> because like I don't want to no, say it that, I agree he is, with you. Right? He's really yeah. attractive in that yeah. film. Like, like his See? eyes are all icy, and he's like got the thing going on. And I'm like, damn, <laughs> Renee, what are you doing? But like, <laughs> but like you know, you kind of there's that romanticizing of that image, but then there's also but just that's like a word to use romanticizing of heroin. I think has been a thing. Yeah, but I mean, like there's romanticizing where, and then you've got like yeah. others where that are like tiny waif. And well, and like, here we are animals. romanticizing vampire vampire. We well, are. Yes, we are cannibals, basically. Yeah, so. I will say though, uh, having dated a couple people that were heroin addicts, that romance does not last. It's not a romantic thing, and most of oh, them no. are tragic. There's just a lot of vomit involved in uh, uh, heroin, so just put that in. a lot of gross stuff going it's on. It's not a great, I mean, no no, no drug's good at, you shouldn't be addicted to any drug. I mean, I'm not saying that. It's just, of all the drugs, heroin's mm. not, that's the one that's a lot of cleanup involved, and it's also very ritualistic. But also, you don't have to shoot it up. You can just smoke it or snort it. But it's still one of those drugs that um, it's not, it, 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 you're basically, it's just, you're doing something different on it. It's a downer. It's not an upper unless you're speedballing, but it's not the greatest drug. Well, you don't have to be a certain weight though. If you're on it a long time, just like if you're on meth a long time, you lose a lot of weight and your teeth. I think with heroin, you will lose weight Mm -hmm. eventually, but uh, not if genetics are involved. If you are predisposed to being big, just because you're on heroin doesn't mean you're going to lose a lot of weight. So if you run out of Ozempic and think I'm going to do heroin to keep that weight loss going, that's not a good choice at all. And I don't know why I just said that, but I'm just saying that now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you can be, oh, you can be a normal weight. Oh my lord, you guys! <laughs> What's that? I'm just like, where is this conversation going? Oh, I, do. I don't even know. Like, I can't even keep up. With this is why I shouldn't be on a podcast for longer than an hour because then I I'll just can't start keep up with this. We gotta go back. How am I single? Yeah, no, I shouldn't. So, talk so, so, so overall, I think this is a really artistic, beautiful film. Yes. Um, I think it's original, and I think that there's lots of that can be taken from it. I think there's different ways that you can view it. And it's full of nuance and abstraction. Um, and I think that the soundtrack is so original and, spe- and it's just really, really well done. Um, I hope to see more things like this from her at some point. Um, I would like to check out her other two films that I didn't know about. So <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, but I think that I think that I'll watch this again, though, because I do think that there's stuff that I probably missed because this time again, like I hadn't watched it in 10 years. You know, mm. like it's been literally almost 10 years. Oh my years. God, is that how long it's been since it's been so, out? Yeah, 2014, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's 2024. So, and I watched it. So, like, I feel like today when I rewatched it, I was just so like enamored with the fact that of the way that the black and white was and the depths of the blacks and the, the levels of the shadows and how like everything just played off each other so beautifully and the music with the, with the film and like that sort of like meshing of that. 
that I think that there's a lot of depth that I probably did not catch up on. And I think that that that's what makes a really good film for me is that you can watch it again and you can catch different things or you can, you know, watch it again and find a different love for it or find a different perspective to take if you just look at it through a different lens. You know, and I think yeah. that's a film that you can do. And like you said, there's all these different sort of sort of story arcs in there embedded within. You know, like I want to know more about the cat too. I know, I was just gonna say oh, that. I was like, at one point, he's like, "Your mother's in the cat. Your mother's in the cat." Like, uh, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. "Is the mother in the cat?" <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if they did a version of this movie just from the cat's point of view? I would yeah, watch that. I, love it. I would totally watch that. <laughs> I love the cat. I know. I keep forgetting about the cat, and the cat's like the, the character as everybody else in this. The cat's story. seen a lot, man. That, that cat's, cat's seen been through some stuff. Yeah, that cat. Who she is? She is. Stuff. Yeah. That's a good point. No, I, I, all, I think it's a really, really great film. And I think that, I mean, of course, my favorite part of it is is definitely the way that the sound just went. Like, I think that yeah. it was a really unique score. Um, and there was a lot of different elements in the score. Like you said, like, there was just, like, there was parts where it was very quiet. And then there would just be, like, the heartbeat. Or then, the, you know, and then it would go into kind of that, that like, western -y kind of thing. But then it would go into, like, these, like, dancey tracks that, like, you know, by what is it, White Lies or whatever that like, I was White like, Lies, oh, I, listen yeah. I listen to other songs by this band, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, like, I, you know, I dance to this and this is stuff that I listen to like on a daily basis. And I just kind of like that eclectic weaving of different types of music and sounds to, to go with a movie that had such a noir sort of stark aesthetic to it. I just thought it was really a great pairing and very unique. That's all I need to yeah. say. That's yeah. my spiel. That's my spiel. I like it. Yeah. I think no. I'm I'm just... that like the chick's very hot. I love the the like like you said that juxtaposition between jumping to two, but also like I love the way that they're like the the, the film is like jumps between eras. It jumps between like you know it almost it jumps between locations. You can't really tell where we are when it what time it is um you know are we in the 50s are we in the 60s are we in like the 90s i don't know are we back like we have, you have no idea and i kind of like that weird ghetto like in between space where you kind of there is no everything's kind of left in this weird kind of vague kind of spot and I, it's like kind of that's what i like the or most it's just like movie. a different era completely and a different exactly. timeline on a that's different what i was about to say yeah, that um, scene, the scene where, you know, they confront each other on the street when he's Dracula and he says, why am I here? And he's saying, why am I here? Why am I here? And then as he goes closer and he goes, why, why, why is it, why are we here? Like just him and her. And that, that to me is that moment. I'm like, why are they, you know, where is this? Where is this time? And it's almost like they're in their own space and time. There's this like weird kind of bubble and this weird universe that they're, they're within. And I love that kind of, that playing with that. Are they actually in limbo? Yeah, because yeah, it, like it feels like they are. Like very there's this weird, like you know, and everyone dying and everyone being quiet, you know, and not knowing, you know, kind of what's gone. And only like that, I love that whole eerie kind of sense and vibe with this film. And then I love that, you know, the that yeah, you can't tell what time it is, but it's always sort of, it's always present. And every sure. you know, so much going on. It's so exciting, even though it's not like pounding like fast it's just like you're going slowly but there's all these little bits in and i just love that there's this mixture of yeah like this kind of old time with modern times this kind of pop culture thing in there with the you know with the music and and the vibe and you know all these nods to different things like you know like you said with james dean you know and then you've got you, you madonna you've got like that real french kind of cinema kind of vibe that's going on and you've got you know spaghetti westerns that kind of you sin cities like all of this stuff is all in there and it's like and then throw in a skateboard for good measure. Like, it's just like, there's so much cool, like, stuff going on at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, like, even her striped shirt kind of references French uh, New Wave cinema. Yeah, exactly. It reminds me exactly of, like, um, John Le Cacard. Like, he's, you know, where he, the yeah. girl's always, pretty much always wearing yeah, it. Right? and everything, yeah. Yeah. yeah and then, like, I know the uh, A Beau, du Fe, a beau Soufflé, was it? Yeah. That one? I can't say it right now because I am not... I'm very tired. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. This is my second podcast, or this is That's my second right. live stream today. Oh, I did God. my live stream earlier today, so I'm like, you're my, um, you're my first humans besides the washing machine tech guy and uh, my delivery guy from uh, Amazon. So I mean, that, <laughs> well, I here's the thing that when you you know what you just described, Renee, that 
what time are we in? What era are we in? I grew up in a very rural town in Kansas that has, when you're, when you grow up in a space like that, you're always behind the times you get fashion, mm. wait, you get fashion and pop culture. And this is before the internet, before streaming, mm. before anything we have to it. So mm. but when you grow up in a space like that, in an era like that, like I did, there is a sense of what, what, what decade are we in? Because you don't have, these clues to modern civilization like you do now where like if you yeah, take a I, film you realize real quick what era you're in yeah where well i think it, and it works i think in the dynamic where you know i mean it's indicative of this whole you know this whole discourse around the film film in the sense that you know the that isolation that like control not being able to you know we don't know when it is and and also like a lot of the stuff, as I mentioned in the film, is not even you know it's banned in in Iran anyway. Like so, yeah. there's a lot, a lot, you know, in the film that's very different. So it's like there is, there's this like you know, I guess there's like, uh, well, John just mentioned is that even in the comments, and you're exactly right. There's this, you know, there's this like, like push and throw, and like this kind of like you know being caught between what is modern and past, and you know trying to move forward but still being stuck behind by all of the kind of outdated mm -hmm. rules and outdated yeah. you know um, views on on things well, even and cuba even cuba was like that for a long time they wouldn't allow importing of vehicles so all the vehicles yeah. in cuba were these beautiful like 1950s cuz people had to take care of them cuz there was no i'm no going to get ones, a car. Yeah. there was no i'm going to get a next car so a lot of cuba felt like it was trapped in time because they weren't allowed to have new cars come in. So you had only certain year of cars and certain amount of cars from like 1950s yeah. to 60s. So it's also like when you're in a, a community or a country that's kind of like very controlled, um, yeah, yeah. whatever era that is, um, if it's very controlled, you're probably not getting, it's like 1980s Russia was very distinct because they didn't have what 2024 Russia has. Like it's just, very interesting too. I mean, United States is like that too, but not to that level. Uh, yeah, we, yeah. we tend to, you just see it through fashion and pop culture and yeah, through different eras of poli policies, political stuff, political unrest and civil unrest. But with this film, you know, you have to remember it's supposed to be in Iran, not in Taft, California. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah. It is a culture that I'm not 100% familiar with. So I kind of just took it as, oh, this is the culture. But I do like that instead of a CD player, you get a record player. And instead of certain things, you get more analog. So it's not iPhone this, iPhone that. And I think that yeah. adds to the charm of the film as well and the timelessness of it. By the way, I could barely keep up with tech as a human. I couldn't even fathom being a vampire having to keep up with everything. I would probably be like old man Winters in the back going, all oh, these kids today, but I'd be saying it constantly about kids no, from I hundreds think that, of years I, I ago. Think vampires would be faster at picking things up, I would think. Yeah, I do think too. For the survival, they have to be. They, I guess well, they would. Yeah, I think because they're also their 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 senses are quicker. Everything. I think that they would just like pick up everything fast and fast. In fact, I think that like if if there were vampires, some of them could be some of the brilliant, most brilliant minds that would be creating the technology. Oh, 100%. They'd be like at the forefront. It's kind of, what were, <laughs> kind of what they were insinuating with Blade, right? That like, yeah. you, you know, with Stephen Dorff's oh, yeah. character. Yeah, they're Stephen probably Dorf's really good. character in Blade, like he was trying to be the kind of like the vampire non well, vampire attractive Elon Musk, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's like, yeah, it's, yeah, I guess, yeah. yeah right you would have to um but yeah i guess the, the my kind of thing at the end of this film i guess is that like for me it's kind of like i don't know this the, you've got all these beautiful things beautiful things um you know <laughs> and as for the, the way it's shot all of that is just amazing and um but yeah you kind of I, ha, I love it because you have this flip side where it is like you know it's breaking down like these you know what is this sort of the societal rules what are the expectations and things of gender and then viewing it kind of in, in this different lens, which is looking at this kind of the, the you know, the Iranian lens and, and mm -hmm. what women are actually going through well, there. Yeah, because it's, and sorry, then, I, just had, I just had a thought, yeah. I just had a thought, I'm so sorry. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because like, okay, so he's really like the heroin addict dad, right? He's like really upset because his wife has gone, like the wife probably was holding him together. Like, and, mm -hmm. and like, think about the role that she had probably in holding that family together. And then when she's yeah. gone, like everything falls apart. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Though. No, that's exactly it. Well, because the, the, the woman very much plays that role in the, in the home and, yeah. you know, and, and is that, 
vital component, especially in the, uh, again. in the family unit there, yeah. Um, and, yeah, and then I think, you know, on, on the back of that, then you, you also then look at, you know, we're looking at what is, you know, I guess the the abuse of power that, you know, that we that we see. And then, like, I guess, you know, that abuse of power and how it inevitably, you know, comes from men and, and how, you know, that is prioritised and, you know, that is prioritised and then how men are prioritised and protected over women, like, within that society and within within that, you know, that place in the world. You know, it, um, that's something that I guess we don't 100% understand because we, we're not from that that culture. We don't understand what it's like to be living there. But um, I think it gives you a really good, you know, it gives us an indication of something that can, is very much relatable to our own to our own um, world and lives we're living in. And I think when, I mean, Anna said that it wasn't, you know, necessarily a feminist film, but, you know, that she thought that maybe the film is more so about what women see in the film of their own lives and that's how it has turned out to be, you know, seemingly like a feminist film. Um, and then I guess then you have the, like I mentioned, the whole thing with the with violence and gendered violence and men ex exploiting and abusing women, you know, for their own for their own power. And then that kind of that age old thing of where women are just expected to sit back passively. Um, you know, there's a scene with um, with the lady of the night in the car with the pimp, and he's mm -hmm. saying to her like, "Don't you want to have children?" Like, yep. don't you? That's what all women that she's old at 30 years old. Yeah, at 30 years old, right? And then when he's upset with yeah. her, lady, he, throws, he throws her on the ground and calls her a hag. Yeah. And I was like, man, if she's a hag, then I'm dumb. I know. I'm like, like right? uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, there's all these kind of like really sharp like commentary on mm -hmm. a lot of different things, which I really love the way that Anna was able to incorporate that into film, but not make it too. It's not too overtly there, but it's enough there that it really like leaves a mark. And yeah, I think that that's how I kind of see this whole film is that it's it just it leaves a mark with you, and you have no idea what you're going into when you're watching it, and you come out and you just there's so many things you can take away from this film, and 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 there's a lot to ponder and a lot to kind of think about and want to investigate. Like I know when I watch this, like set you know this like all of these things like set at, against the backdrop of Iran was really like for me it was really like wow this is really like fuck this is pushing the envelope man I've never seen I didn't even know they had skateboards in Iran like I know that's a dumb thing to say but let alone one with a woman on it like you know it's hard enough just in western places to see women on skateboards let alone you know so and and, and just everything that was going on I thought like this must be an incredibly influential and an incredibly groundbreaking film from from that other lens so yeah and just seeing a woman coming from a different background and embracing her own her own past and embracing her own future and just doing what doing what she wants to do and i think that that's what i got from this film the most yeah i agree and that's it's yeah i think that's a, again a great statement of what a good movie is when you think about it that way and you want to think about it in different lenses and and you everyone's gonna i mean we're human so we're all gonna project our own things when we watch movies, right? Like our own takeaways, our own what we're interested in or what we pay attention to. And I think this is a good example of, even though she says it's not a feminist, I think it's, it's kind of a loaded statement to say a movie's feminist or not because we're still all trying to figure out what that word means to mm. everyone a different well, word. It's a word, that, it's a word that's changing rapidly every I day. Constantly. And also changes within. Like I, I've said many times when I wrote the book Crafting with Feminism, a lot of the bad reviews I was getting wasn't from, you know, dudes who don't like feminists. It was from feminists saying I misunderstood feminism or I was making fun of feminism, which I was not. Mm -hmm. But there's so many different waves of feminism that there's a lot of infighting of what does that word mean? And also every generation kind of has their own idea. Like I was in a riot girl band, so I have a very punk rock view of feminism and I'm very, you know, pro trans, but also pro non-binary. And I don't, I think feminism is a bigger thing than having a uterus. Like I think it's uh, it's a lot, but a lot of people don't, and a lot of people are very traditional. And also, there's you know trad wife stuff coming up where oh people God, are not please don't get me started on that. I know, but it's like you know, I for me, I feel like women should be free to do what they want. But when you use the word feminism or feminist, it means so many things to so many different women that when you say, oh, this is a feminist movie or not. That could be a positive or a negative, depending on who you're talking to. I consider it a positive, but 
this movie is a very interesting take on things because it's also culturally different. It's coming mm -hmm. from Iran. It's not feminine. Feminism in Iran probably means something completely different than American feminism. And also uh, it depends on the age of the person. So I think that, you know, it's okay for her to say, yeah, this isn't a feminist movie per se, because what she thinks is feminist might not be what other people think. What I think is it's a female centric film. And because well, that's, that's sort of what she said, you know, essentially yeah, the female, it's a female it's film, film, you're going to get a female as, a, as that way. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is, I mean, that's fine too. I, I'm interested. <laughs> so I want you to watch Bad Batch and tell me if you think it's feminist or not. Cause I think mm -hmm. the lead character is a woman and she encounters many different types of women and different types of independence and peril. It would be very interesting. I think Renee and Jenna, if you want to watch it, I think it's on Amazon prime or something or Netflix. I think it's Amazon Prime. Bad Batch is very interesting because how it depicts women, it runs the gamut of what is a woman, was a mother, was a daughter, was a sister, what's a, you know, it's very interesting. And I would like to, and also I think the Mona Lisa and the Blood Moon is probably also going to be since the two lead characters. Well, yeah. And one's a killer and one's not, or maybe one's not a killer. Maybe one, I don't know, like just from the trailer, yeah. I'm assuming. And it's into the least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting. So, and also, she does have an episode too in uh, Guillermo del oh, Toro's like, Cabinet of the Curiosities. Yeah, so I've seen it already. Yeah, mm -hmm. so Anna has. I don't think she wrote. It. I think she directed it. I don't know if she wrote directed, it. Directed it's, though. It's in there. Yeah, it's in there, and that's interesting. It's also interesting to just oh, see what she's, when she's not doing movies. Her TV work. She did two Twilight Zone episodes. So that's. I think the Gordon Peele uh, series. Yeah, and also, yeah. Really, and also, if you like uh, Sheila Van, who plays the girl in this movie. She's in the Snowpiercer, Snowpiercer TV series. Yeah. So she's a main character in that. So if you like what she's doing, you can see her in a lot of different things. But uh, I also love her work. So it's a good, mm. it was a good combo, those two making this movie. I can't imagine. Yeah. So what, um, I was going to say, um, I was going to say, yeah. So what, I guess, <laughs> go and watch this day movie is my, is my like final thought. <laughs> yeah, final thought. Jenna, what's your final, very, very final, final thought? <laughs> My final, final thought is, yeah, go watch this movie. And I can't wait to hang out with you ladies again. Yay. Uh, I don't have anything astute to say. I'm sorry. I really don't right now. And my final thought was probably an hour ago. So I kind of feel like I've had a lot of final thoughts. have a lot of final thoughts. Like, Our final thought is thank you for joining us. Yes. And, and yes, um, we, we, had a, we had a rogue evening tonight, but you know what? I think that's, we you did. know, I think if you watch this show, you know it by now that it can go in any which way direction. So, um, but yeah, I enjoyed this film. I think it's fair to say all three of us enjoyed this film. Um, and it, it's, it gets a big um, recommendation from us. So um, yes, everyone. And thank you for joining. And as always, like, yeah, if you have ideas on, on movies that you really want us to talk about, drop them. In Twitter, drop them, you know, in our Facebook, drop them on Instagram, drop them like wherever you want. Do one, I feel like we need to do one that we don't, or that some of us don't like or something. Oh, I feel like, should we? I feel like we Ooh. keep doing movies that we, like, love. And it's I, true. I, it's I, true. I it's because I hate talking like, about movies I hate. <laughs> yeah, because um, I, I guess because I'm not going to I'm not, I hate, like, sitting there and just going, I hate this. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of why I never talk about ones like, because it's harder to, like, I don't know. You can I talk for hours about why you don't like something. I have one recommendation or two. Well, one. Yeah. Yeah, one and a half. I would say mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Everyone loved that and I hated that film. So yeah. if we want to watch, if we want to critique that. Or mm -hmm. Saltburn was very polarizing, though I don't consider salt. Or I haven't seen either, either of them, so. Uh, I that was a movie I thought by I, I think I, I think I kind of get Renee, though. Like, let's be more positive and let's talk about things. Yeah, like I just feel like I, I, I kind of like I don't want to be that, you know, that old guy who's like sits there oh, and just says, this is shit, this is shit. I don't want to, I don't want to promote yeah. shit that we love. You don't want to be shit. like, uh, you don't want to be like bitchy Robert Ebert or Pitchfork where they just hate exactly. everything. No, I, I just want to do like, let's focus on what's good. And, and I what think we what, we get do, what we do, I think is very unique in the sense that we pick films that uh, are a lot of them are female centric, right? Or they're female filmmakers that don't get a lot of attention, or maybe it's movies that are underrated, right? That we're like, mm -hmm. hey, take a look at this. What I would like us to do, maybe, is go back and go watch a really old one from the 70s or the 60s 
like a hammer, like a hammer film, like one of the old vampire hammer movies, I think would be really fun. Or maybe a, a, a Gallo, Italian Gallo, like Argento movie, mm -hmm. um, because there's so many great ones that are just so beautifully visually, but also there's some problematic stuff that happens in a lot of those like Italian, uh, you know, horror films from the 70s and 60s. So I think maybe instead of like picking a modern one we don't like, why don't we go way, way back and go to like 60s or 70s horror and find something that maybe none of us have watched or have an opinion on, or maybe okay. one, or maybe one that everyone says you have to watch this as a horror fan. That maybe I've watched, I've watched more of those movies than any other movie there is. So I mean, no, I just want to say I. <laughs> I've watched them all, but I have a memory of a goldfish, so I've probably forgotten most of them. But I, I like we watched the original Suspiria or Opera or Tenenbrae or any of those. They're all my favorites, though. I love I Suspiria. Love I love Tenenbrae. But like they are problematic in other ways. But I will say visually, yeah. they're great, so. they are. But I guess yeah, they. I guess they are. But I love them for what they are. So I guess yeah. that's you know. Yeah, but maybe maybe, maybe, maybe you know, I mean, Lesbian vampire killer one, like I mean, we're gonna run out of movies and ideas to. to I know that's the thing. Like, I would rather us focus on an older movie than a modern movie we don't like. I think older movies, there's, there's so much. I mean, we're kind of blessed in the fact that streaming has brought us access to so many old horror films that people don't even know about. So. Actually, there's a shit ton of really new ones just coming out. I, I know, see. I know. There's a lot of new ever, there's a new Australian film. When, that, does, um, when does our what? movie? When does Maxine come out? When does the <clears> bird in the uh, bird not yet? Out? A couple a month month or so. It's got Halsey in it. Does it? What? It's got Halsey in it. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. But it hasn't come out yet, right? Like it isn't done. Done. It's not yet. out yet. No. Okay. Okay. Well, interested to see Halsey in it. Maybe yeah. maybe this is when we ask our viewers to put in the comments any movies they uh, think we should be watching. We've or got we've gotten like quite a big list of similar ones that everyone wants okay. us to sort of do. So they're yeah, interesting, interesting yeah. ones I never would have thought we would talk about to be honest. Yeah. But um, interesting choices. I love the um, appendage. People keep telling me to watch appendage. See? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. There's a nice. new, there's a new Australian horror out that's getting really good reviews as well. Yeah, if you want to do an Aussie one, maybe we should do an Aussie one. Oh no, there's plenty. There's so much good stuff coming out. Okay, well, I have no shortage we have time of time to think about it, ladies. We yeah. got it. Um, next up, I'm thinking <laughs> you gotta walk the dog. You can catch me. I'm on Movie Night Extravaganza next week, talking Aussie. I'm doing Picnic at Hanging Rock, one of my favorite old oh. films. I've been to Hanging Rock many, many times. So I've got some great oh, stories to go along with it so we can get creepy together. So come join us, um, me on that one with the guys and gal. Um, Jenna, what are you, have you got anything coming up in the next week, Bonnie? Um, not really. I am working on my degree still, but because um, I, I graduate in like two and a half months. But um, I am I'm making an appearance next month. I will be at um, Exotica Chicago. So nice. if you are in the area, I'm making a very, very rare appearance at a convention. I will have autographed materials, one of a kind items, new posters, a whole slew of things. Um, and then I'll also be appearing at Exotica, New Jersey in the fall. Um, and I'm still working on my projects. My film is actually, it's, it's I just reviewed the first draft the other day. And it's actually happening, so it should be out in three months. So yeah, I'm just I'm just busy hustling over here. So <laughs> getting shit done. Uh, I'll be I'll be at WonderCon. So if you're in Anaheim mm -hmm. next weekend, I'll be at WonderCon. Probably Friday night. I think I have a I'm on a panel of with TV writers and other writers uh, talking about writing complex characters. Mostly mine will be about murder characters because of the stuff I've written for Hunt a Killer Games, but also Magic the Gathering murder mystery game I just wrote that came out this year. So I'll be talking kind of like on murdery, murdery type, like murdery topics, murdery type characters. I know. Shocker. Um, and then I have a monthly podcast I do with Felicia day on felicitations, which is on her Twitch and on, on also her YouTube, um, where we review uh, a book once a month. And I think we're doing, I feel like we're doing a fantasy book about goblins this month. I haven't started it yet, but you can find me over there. You can go to just my YouTube channel and I have, uh, all the playlists for this show, but also that show and other shows I'm doing. And then I'm also just hustling, trying to find work. All my contract jobs are done. 
So now I'm just trying to find more paid work as a writer. So now it's just mostly like, okay, what am I doing? But I'm also like writing a comic that is a, oh yeah, when we were young, it's a comic anthology that supports the Trevor Project. And it's all queer creators. Awesome. Yeah, it's all queer creators. It's all, You can see information on my Twitter. I have my Bonnie Girl handle right there is all my social media. But it's uh, on Kickstarter right now. And I think we're almost to our goal. So if you want to check that out. But it's got a bunch of different uh, writers on that. Sam Max is a writer for it. Um, there's great artists on it. It's an anthology of what would you tell yourself as a young person before you come out as queer. And all people have, people have all different kinds of stories. But my story is about a bisexual uh, teenage girl who hides her bisexual because she's in the middle of Kansas. That's kind of autobiographical. She's in Kansas and she comes out when she joins a coven of, of teen girls. So it's kind of like the craft meets jawbreaker meets um, ginger snaps. So it's kind of like that, vibe. but also bi. So there's that. <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. Uh, and, and, and beautiful friends that have joined us. Um, it's time for me to nap. <laughs> yeah, I've, got to nap. I've, got to, I've got to get to bed. I've got a photo shoot tomorrow. So. <laughs> Hi, where is Jenna? Hey, Jenna, uh, contact me when you want to go dinner again. I miss you. Yes, let's do it soon. Okay, cool. Bye. 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 Bye.